two, one. Okay, thank you. Good evening. This is Chairwoman Makita Scott. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, January 5th, 2021. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. We will then have a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. Mr. Mahumza, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes, good evening. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. In accordance with the mandated direction of the state superintendent, Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are currently closed to the public in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the maryland open meetings act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting as a result, tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through Microsoft Teams Live. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. Board members will say their names while making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the January 5th um, of the January 5th agenda. And at this time, I move that we add an agenda item to this meeting, unfinished business, the reopening of schools to be placed after item K, board policies. Second, Second. Molly. Ken. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Gober, may I have a roll call vote, please? Madam Sarah? Chair, is there a discussion? I believe the motion speaks for itself. OK, I, I don't have the hand raise option. Uh, may I speak? Yes, please. Um, who's speaking, please? This is Miss Causey. Thank you, Miss Causey. Um, I just wanted to uh, support your motion. I appreciate you uh, making it. It's certainly something that uh, the board has had um, very vigorous discussions about and is certainly at the top of our minds as we address uh, how to support our students uh, moving forward through the rest of the pandemic. So thank you for that. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Madam Chair. Yes, Ms. Hen. Thank you. I would like to offer the following amendment to your motion. Um, in addition to amending tonight's agenda to add the discussion of the reopening of schools as the first item of unfinished business, I further move that we suspend the time limit for board member questions on this agenda item. Lastly, I move that this agenda item be the standing first item of unfinished business on all subsequent open session agendas until all schools have fully reopened to all students for full time in person instruction. Second. Point of order, Ms. Scott. Ms. Hen's motion, the second one is operational. You're adding something to the agenda. She's requesting a time limit, and that should be a separate motion by itself. Okay, thank you for that, Ms. Hen and Ms. Joes. Um, I would say, um, Ms. Hen, I, um, at this time, I would not accept that amendment because I believe that could be a standalone separate motion. So um, I, I would 
recommend making that as a separate motion, um, a standalone motion. OK, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for that. Excuse me, Madam Chair. It was a motion and it was seconded, so I believe we need to process that. We could uh, request guidance from Mr. Brusades. Well, the motion was direct and speaks for itself um, that an item be added to the agenda. So it was a motion was made, it was seconded, and so I believe the appropriate act to announce the vote on that motion. Um, excuse me, Madam Chair, I would ask uh, legal counsel for guidance because there was an amendment motion and a second. Okay. Ha was, did, did Ms. Hen withdraw her amendment? I did not, Mr. Bersades. Then I believe we would need to vote on the amendment. But the amendment was not accepted to the motion. Well, I believe we need to vote on it. OK, so the next course would be to vote on the amendment. Vote on the amendment and then vote on the either the original motion or the original motion as amended if the amendment gets voted up. OK, so the, the next course order. is actually to, I'm Thank sorry. You. Madam Chair, I have a point of order. I believe the appropriate parliamentary procedure when someone disagrees with the decision of the chair not to accept an amendment or a motion is to appeal the decision of the chair to the board and for the board to decide if the amendment is in order or not. So are you making a motion to appeal the decision of the chair? I'm not. I'm raising a point of order that um, I believe the parliamentary advice is incorrect and that the appropriate procedure at this time if the, so when a motion or amendment is made, the chair has to accept the motion or amendment and restate the motion or amendment. In effect, the chair did not accept the amendment or a motion and the appropriate procedure when someone disagrees with the decision of the chair is to appeal the decision of the chair to the full board and to vote on the decision of the chair. So if someone wants to disagree with the decision of the chair not to accept the amendment, that is the procedure is for someone to make an motion to appeal the amendment to the full board or to appeal the decision of the chair to the full board. Mr. Persaise. I'm not making that motion. I'm simply stating that. Mr. Persaise, could you give us a legal opinion on that, please? I, I think both get to the same end result as to whether the amendment to the motion is going to be approved by the board. Okay. Then, Madam Chair, may I restate my amendment? Yes, please. Thank you. I move that the board amend tonight's agenda to add the discussion of the reopening of schools as the first item of unfinished business. I further move that we suspend the time limit for board member questions on this agenda item. Lastly, I move that this agenda item be the standing first item of unfinished business on all subsequent open session agendas until all schools have fully reopened to all students for full time in person instruction. Madam Chair, I move to divide the amendment in three parts as it, is, as it is three separate items. Well, the amendment was stated. Um, Ms., uh, I believe that was Ms. Rowe. Could you repeat that, please? I had a hard time hearing you. Um, I'm requesting to divide the amendment into three parts as the amendment is actually three separate things, and I wish to vote on each thing separately. So I'm, okay. I'm asking to divide the question. And, okay. and as I understand it, the, the, the main motion is your motion, Ms. Scott, correct? That is correct. And Ms. Hen is, has two amendments to it, one regarding time and one regarding placement on subsequent agendas. Correct. So I, I, I think it would there be, were three. It, it, correct. There were two amendments. Thank you, Mr. Bersades. Right. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Bersades. And as to Ms. Rowe's comment about dividing the question, I think that would be appropriate as well to rule individually on each of Ms. Hen's amendment, starting with the time amendment. OK, so then what we need to do then is vote on Ms. Hen's amendments each separately. Correct. Starting okay. with starting with suspending the time limit for board member questions. Okay, so then um, Ms. Gover, if we could do a roll call vote, starting with 
Ms. Hen's amendment of, susp of um, suspending the time limits for board member questions. On this topic. On this topic, yes. Can we discuss one? Sure? Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to comment. Uh, I support uh, the motion. I think it's a very important uh, thing to discuss about the reopening and what's happening with, with the school systems work. I just don't think suspending the time limit is really helpful. Um, at times, if we we don't have a time limit, we tend to repeat ourselves, uh, ask questions that staff might not have, and just prolongs the meeting. I really liked how the meetings have run smoothly so far, and I just don't think we should suspend the time limit and uh, have another uh, past midnight meeting like we did earlier on. Thank you. Madam Chair, can I speak to my amendment? Yes, Ms. Hen. Thank you. I under, fully understand and appreciate Mr. Mahomes' concerns. I believe that the second amendment of placing this agenda item um, on subsequent agendas will address his concern of the late night meetings, because if this is a standing agenda item, board members will have frequent opportunities to have their concerns addressed, and we will not need to extend the time um, into all hours of the evening. So I do believe that the second amendment, if approved, will address the concerns about the lengthy discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Um, additional follow discussion? Yeah, quick follow up question. So uh, Ms. Hen, uh, are you saying that um, we're going to uh, stick to the time limit? So like right now, how the agendas are re written, um, for example, the superintendent's report is from 645 to 650. So if we have that time block and we run out of that time block, but not everybody speaks. Let's say I take, if I'm the board member speaking, and I take most of that time. So is this agenda going to go to the next meeting? So hypothetically, one board member can speak the whole time. Thank you for that question, Mr. Hamza. I believe that by removing the restriction of the time limit, because this topic is so very important um, to our students, that and by placing it on um, each meeting's agenda, that naturally it will result in less time being spent on this agenda item because board members will have more opportunities um, more frequently to have their questions addressed. So I believe as a natural progression um, that board members will have fewer questions. Does that answer your question? So, so like hypothetically, um, one or two board members could essentially take up, take most of the time in that allocated like um, agenda item. Right. Hypothetically, they could, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, in the interest of time, I want to make sure all members' questions are heard. Um, Mr. Offerman has a comment. I would suggest that we vote on the second amendment before the first, because the second amendment is approved uh, following the logic that, that we were uh, that we, that were given. There would be no need to have uh, any kind of untimed discussion tonight. OK, um, are there were there any other comments or questions from board Ms. members? Scott, Ms. Scott, I'd like to say something. Yes, Mr. Uh, McMillian. I appreciate Madam Scott putting that on the agenda, and I trust the board leadership because of the importance of this topic. They'll make sure that this is on the future agendas. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. All right. Yes. Yeah. Is that Mrs. Pastor? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I just want to uh, support Mr. Offerman, Mr. Offerman's assertion, um, just based on what Ms. Hen said um, as her response to Mr. Mahomsa, that if we vote on uh, doing this at every meeting and as at the beginning of every meeting, it might well take care of uh, the time frame because everyone will know we'll get to talk about it at each meeting and we do not have to talk long about any point. Just to support Mr. Offerman's statement. Thank you, Mr. Um, Was that Ms. Rowe? 
Yes, I'd like to make a motion that we table the current amendment and process the second one first and come back to this one after we process that one. Okay, I believe I heard you say you make a motion. Uh, could you repeat that again? Because you said you went out. I move to table the current amendment that we are processing in order to take the next amendment first and come back to this amendment afterwards. Second. Hen. Okay. Okay, then, uh, Ms. Um, Hen, could you please then read your second, the second part of your amendment? Sure. I move that this agenda item be the standing first item of unfinished business on all subsequent open session agendas until all schools have fully reopened to all students for full time in person instruction. Okay, thank you. Any discussion? Okay, Ms. Gilver, may we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Ms. Yes. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Han? Yes. Mr. Mahamza? Yes. Mr. Ackerman? Yes. Ms. Tester? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Amendment carries. Okay, um, and then now we would vote on the second part of the amendment. And Ms. Hen, could you restate again the second part of the amendment? Of course, Madam Chair. Thank you. I further move that we suspend the time limit for board member questions on this agenda item. Ms. Scott, may I speak to that, please? Is that Ms. Mack? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Mm -hmm. um, I, like everybody else, um, don't want to have meetings that go till midnight, but I think given certain subject matters, um, I, I think we need to be less worried about when the board meeting ends and more worried about making sure that the needs of our students, our parents, our teachers and administrators are met. And if that takes more than two minutes a board member, then so be it. This is a very, very important topic. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Um, Mr. Mahomsa? Yes, again, I do appreciate what everybody's saying about the importance of this topic, right? What we've heard uh, previously from our, uh, from our constituents about us having these long meetings, at times what we're discussing has been repeated by other board members. And some of those questions are not even answered by staff and there's not much progress. I, I just really don't see the purpose of it. I have liked seeing uh, meetings uh, not going over midnight and us asking questions that have not been answered before and running the uh, meetings uh, smoothly. And I, I would not support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mahomes. Up next, Ms. Causey. Thank you. I just want to say I support um, everything that Ms. Mack said. This is the most important issue in front of our children and our parents and our teachers uh, and the community at large. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Ms. Rowe? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I would just like to say that we have time limits for a reason, and I believe that those reasons are valid. And if we're putting this on the agenda for every single meeting, there is plenty of time to ask various questions within the time limit. And I do believe that we can submit questions in writing. And if the board so choose, we could move that those questions be given to the public and answer. So there are options to obtain information without suspending the rules on a time limit. Thank you. Ms. Scott, I'd like to say Thank something, Rod McMillian. Yes, Mr. McMillian. I support Ms. Rowe and Ms. Mahamza's comment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Madam Chair. Yes, Ms. Hen. 
I would just like to add that the more information the board receives, the less time we'll need for questions. So it all depends on what information we receive from staff and that is easily accomplished by getting the information we ask for up front and in advance. Um, board members could submit questions in advance if that would be helpful to staff. And again, by placing this on each meeting's agenda, our needs for information should decline as we progress. And also as the system progresses with its readiness towards reopening, um, again, our needs for information should decline. Um, I would support revisiting this should this um, amendment pass and reinstating the time limits if we find that this is a problem. But I do think that the natural progression of um, this dynamic would be for us to spend less and less time if we get the information we request and as the system progresses towards greater readiness. Thank you. Thank you for that, Ms. Hen. Um, and I would like to just speak that I believe that time limits are important. Um, I believe that it is the role of members to um, ask questions um, and sometimes questions will be answered. Sometimes it will take additional research, um, but again, um, it is important. I feel that that we have time limits. So um, is there additional discussion? Yes, this is Ms. Pastua. Yes, Ms. Pastua. Uh, I, I want to support what Ms. Max said in terms of the importance and the value of this particular topic, I see very little that's more important. However, uh, you have put into play in place opportunities for us to send in questions and concerns beforehand, which should abate that time frame going over and Lord knows when you're talking about instruction and the children, I'm certainly the first one who will probably be over time. So, but I do feel that if I'm able to send questions in advance and staff is able to give the solid answers that I would like to hear, then I don't need to go beyond the time frame. So, I do support with that in mind the time frame with the notion, and I'm not sure, did I hear Ms. Hen say, or maybe I misunderstood or someone said, if we find based on information we get from staff that we might have to down the road, uh, what, to eliminate the time frame, then we can come back and revisit it, but just as a matter of course, I think we should keep it. Did I hear that correctly from someone? Okay, it doesn't right. really matter, but as long as we can send things in. Okay. Madam? Right. Yes, Ms. Hen. Thank you. I just wanted to put some numbers behind it because I'm a numbers person. So we're talking about two, two minutes per board member, 24 minutes. Um, per meeting. We only meet twice a month, so we're talking less than an hour um, for the most important issue facing our system. Um, our number one job, getting our students back in school. That that really um, minimizes the need and our number one job as a board, and I think it does an enormous injustice to the 115,000 students in our system to put this limit on it. Um, again, and, and Ms. Pester, to your point, I did mention that we could always return to this if we find that certain board members are um, unfairly using an allotment of time that seems inequitable or unfair, then we could revisit that. But by putting an artificial you know, time limit on it, I mean, originally we had decided on three minutes per board member. At some point we said, no, we're going to limit it to two minutes. For, for some topics, yes, this is the most important issue facing our, our students. And I think by putting an artificial time limit on it where we're watching the clock instead of doing our jobs is doing an injustice. And I, I will be supporting this amendment for that reason. Thank you. Madam Chair. Yes, who is that? Josh Mahamza. Yes, Mr. Mahamza. Yeah, although I'd appreciate Ms. Uh, Hen's uh, comments. I, I just don't think they're completely accurate. Um, I've, I've, based on what 
uh, my time here and looking at the board meetings, we don't even get that many answers in board meetings, to be honest with you. A lot of our answers are answered through email, through weekly updates, um, or individual board members uh, asking Superintendent Williams of questions. I've never heard, we don't really get uh, answers through um, board meetings. I don't think that's accurate. And if we're going to spend more time just answering questions and stuff saying, we'll get back to you, we'll get back to you, and just wasting this time, I don't think that's really useful. Um, and when we're repeating, some board members have repeated that this is the most important issue for students. I recognize that we support the uh, amendment about having this as a standing uh, uh, agenda item, but the issue about time limits, I just don't, I think board members are gonna abuse it. We're not gonna get answers. And I think we should just focus on the agenda item being a standing document. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. John, I'd like to Next week, oh, this is I'm sorry, Rodney Mr. McMillian, can you go after yeah. Russ? We have not heard from, um, from. Yes, please, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Thank you, then you're next. Thank you, Rod. Mr. Kuhn? Thank you, Ms. Scott. <clears throat> I understand um, people's concerns, um, but we've also, we've already burned a significant amount of time just trying to process this. We haven't even gotten to the actual motion yet. I would suggest that the importance of this topic and the fact that um, the public isn't copied on the emails or on the updates that are provided by the superintendent to us basically is is the main reason why we need to ask these questions and get answers in the open. And um, you know, I'm all for uh, transparency and trying to provide information to parents and advocates and students. So. I will be supporting this measure to not have time limits on this. And I would suggest we just do it this meeting. And if it just runs over, we can change it for the next meeting and, and put some limits in place. But I, I believe we really need to do it for this meeting. Thank you. And Mr. McMillian. As a group, it's taken us two years to come to the point of putting time limits on it. We discussed this at a retreat and no in december or january of two years ago so we we've come to a point as a group that we've we've done something very very positive and controlling the meetings it's my opinion if we vote to allow the waiver of that what's going to happen two or three people are going to talk for 15 or 20 or 25 minutes apiece and and we're not going to come to anything thank you Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Um, and I think this discussion is an example of um, <laughs> why we need time limits. Um, Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to quickly say the, the point of having the time is not just oh. to ask questions and get answers, but for the board to deliberate uh, and make decisions. And sometimes, um, as we have discussed, there are is not the awareness of the information in order for board members to then form motions and then have the time to deliberate those motions. So what we're talking about is not just receiving information, but in fact, deliberating on it, processing it and making decisions. So I agree with Ms. Hen, the more information we get outside of the meeting, then we can spend the time here discussing in open, which is the only time we can have discussions um, and then making decisions. So it's the discussions and the deliberations that require that thoughtful time, considering the pandemic issues that affect each and every factor of the school system. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Causey. And uh, Dr. Williams, did you have a question? Yes, um, so from, <clears throat> from my point of view, um, thank you, Madam Chairperson Scott. Um, we are uh, prepared to provide a quick update tonight. I do support in future meetings providing updates regarding the reopening. Um, I will say it is extremely helpful as it's been a practice that if there are questions um, that those questions are submitted so we can present and to have answers um, when we're presenting during a board meeting um, sometimes the questions may cause additional research. So I, I think it is helpful to have questions in advance. And in terms of any information that's been provided in the weekly update, um, we have circled back 
uh, earlier this year, we, we've been providing those responses in the information item in the agenda. So um, for tonight, uh, we are providing a, based on what was just approved um, and added to the agenda, we, we're happy to provide an update, uh, but moving forward, as we are presenting every board meeting, then it would be helpful if there are questions submitted in advance so we can be prepared. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. Williams. And um, we have um, Ms. Hen, then Dr. Hager. Ms. Hen, did you want to make a comment to your oh, amendment? Dr. Hager was first. Thank you. Oh, my apologies. Dr. Hager? Um, I just wanted to say that I do support the motion um, because I, although I really like time limits a lot, I agree that this topic is way too important. Um, and then to Dr. Williams' uh, point that he just made, um, a lot of times we do ask questions that maybe were in the weekly updates and we get responses um, similar to that was in the weekly update, but because the public doesn't always know that, I think it is important to reiterate it in open session. And so um, if it's okay to ask questions at both in the weekly update and during open session with answers, I think that would be really helpful for the public in general. I'm um, just following up on what Dr. Williams said, but I do support this motion. Thank you, Dr. Hager. Ms. Henn? Thank you. Just real quickly, I wanted to point out that the language of the motion is specific to questions, limiting the time limit for questions. So it does, it doesn't speak to grandstanding, it doesn't speak to um, general comments. So it, it does support um, moving things along and for board members to continue, you know, to have the opportunity to ask questions, but not to make long winded comments on a particular item which is is something we've we've dealt with in the past. So I just wanted to point that out that the wording of my amendment is to um, suspend the time limit for questions and that the chair would be well within her right to um, limit a board member if they were to um, stray from asking specific questions. Thank you. Please call the vote. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Okay, so now um, may we have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Um, Gover. Uh, Ms. Scott, can I just get a clarification? Um, the original amendment was seconded by whom? Did they Who state their name? Who seconded Ms. Rose? I mean, excuse me. Um, I thought Mrs. it was Ms. Causey. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? No. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Jost? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahunza? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pasteur? No. Ms. McCune? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Favor is five. Okay. All right, so that was the um, so that was the amendment and then the original motion then that I put out was to have it add on, have it added um, after item K. Um, unfinished business. So now do we um, I guess that would be Mr. Mercedes. Do we now then vote on the original motion that? Um, yes, that I put out there. It's yes. the original motion as amended. OK, so now we vote on the original motion as amended. OK, so. Um, I would like to restate the motion, um, the original motion that I made, but then also I guess I would like for the um, amendment the uh, to be restated as well. I don't have that in front of me or have that written, so um, I can restate my motion. I said, um, at this time, I move to add an item to the agenda, unfinished business, the reopening of schools to be placed 
after item K board policies. So that would be for for this meeting. All right, can we take a roll call vote? So and I believe it speaks directly for itself. So um, Ms. Gober, sorry, maybe can the, can the amendment be restated as well, please? Yes, Since it's the motion as amended. Ms. Hen, could you please restate the amendment? The one that passed. Yes, the one that passed. Yes, I understand. Thank Lastly, you. I move that this agenda item be the standing first item of unfinished business on all subsequent open session agendas until all schools have fully reopened to all students for full time in person instruction. Thank you. All right, roll call. Come on. May we have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Gover? Ms. Rao? Yes. <laughs> Ms. Kazi? Yes. Ms. Max? Yes. Mr. McNamara? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Great. OK, thank you for that. OK, so moving on um, in accordance with board policy 8314, a majority vote of the board is required to add or remove an item from the agenda. Um, may I have a roll call vote? Ms. Gover? Ms. Scott, we've already processed all the motions. Oh, I, I apologize. Um, uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Williams, was there anything that you um, uh, wanted to add or speak on in regards to the agenda? No, Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Yes, um, uh, who was that, Ms. Hen? Yes. Yes, Ms. Hen. I move to add as unfinished business under K an update on in-person graduation ceremonies. Is there a second? Second, Mac. OK, Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? No. Ms. Causey? Come yes. on. Ms. Causey? Uh, excuse me, Madam Chair, Does do board members need to be reminded to mute their no, we're in the, um, in the process of taking a vote. Thank you. Ms. Did Ms. Kelsey already place her vote? Yes, I did. OK, moving on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Was it in favor or opposed? I'm in favor. Thank you. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pasture? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Uh, Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Favor seven. Okay. Thank you then. The, the revised agenda is approved. All right. Um, and earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the Sorry, following um, reasons. Madam Chair. Yes. What we just took was on a motion to add something to the agenda. Yes. Are we voting to approve the agenda? We already did. We already voted to oh, approve. Okay, the so we processed that. Yep, because I repeated it okay, and thank you. over. Explained. We already did that. All right, but thank you for that. It's always good to <laughs> hear from members. Um, basically, earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons: to one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials 
over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matters matter that affects one or more specific individuals and 15 discuss cybersecurity. If the public body determines that public discussion would constitute a risk to one security assessments or deployments relating to information resources technology two network security information or three deployments or implementation of security personnel critical infrastructure or security devices. The minutes of the closed session and informational summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. Okay. All right, and the next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Williams. So good evening board members, um, Madam Chair. I'm bringing forward the following administrative appointment for your approval of a Title IX coordinator, Department of School Safety. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit D1? So moved, Matt. So Is I can there a second? Them. Thank you. Any discussion? OK, may I have a roll call vote? Ms. Gover? Ms. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yeah. Ms. Jost? Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. So, thank you. Um, the person moving forward for tonight is uh, Ms. Tiffany Eshelman as the Title IX Coordinator in Department of School Safety. Uh, she comes to us as currently as a specialist, the Department of Special Ed Office uh, of Compliance for more than two years. Her previous experience, she served as a grievance specialist in the District of Columbia Public Schools and also worked at the Red Clay Consolidated School District. So congratulations, Ms. Eshelman. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Okay. The next item is public comment. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens as appropriate. We will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow up by his staff. The board is currently accepting written public comments. The board discourages comment on specific student or employee matters, comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County and inappropriate personal remarks. The school system is committed to accessible communication with its stakeholders. Comments from stakeholder groups and other members of the public may be emailed to boe at mybcps.info. So that's boe at my, mybcps.info. The board reserves the right to disseminate public comments through board docs as long as one submitters specifically request their comments be published as part of the public record. Two, the comments adhere to the board's stated guidelines. Three, the comments include the name of the submitter. And four, the comments have been received before 11.59 p.m. on the Monday before the board meeting. So the next on the item, uh, excuse me, the next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report. Dr. Williams. Good evening, Team BCPS. Happy New Year and welcome back. I'm sure that we're all hoping for a fresh start in terms of the challenges that we have already faced this school year. COVID-19 continues to impact all of our operations. Of course, we are in our second month of recovering from a catastrophic ransomware attack. Our focus has been and will remain squarely focused on encouraging and engaging our students in rigorous instruction every school day. 
I have enjoyed visiting virtual classrooms at Church Lane, Edmondson Height, Featherbed Lane, Randallstown, and Seven District Elementary Schools, Deer Park, Magnet Middle, and Catonsville and Owings Mill High School to witness how educators prepare students for winter break, as well as catching up during these past two days. Those connections are crucial. In terms of getting students ready for the future in three weeks, uh, we are still planning the PSAT day for grade 11 students who registered to participate. Another example is from our Advancement via Individual Determination or AVID program. AVID students are using e-binders to organize their digital life, take focus notes using digital templates and tools, and regularly engage in collaborative activities, including tutorials, during which they receive peer support to assist them with concepts that they are challenged by in their other classes. In addition, our school library community is working hard to ensure that all students have equitable access to books, media, virtual and digital resources to support independent reading, classroom instruction and inquiry driven research. This process and investments support the creation of high quality collections of print and non print materials in order to maintain school library collections that are current, relevant and supportive of our curriculum. I would like to thank Dr. Mary Boswell McComas, our Chief Academic Officer, and her team in the Office of Curriculum Instruction for their relentless focus on curriculum and instruction or teaching and learning. Next, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge two of our outstanding educators. Deanna Gianelli of uh, Perry Hall Middle School was named Maryland Secondary Assistant Principal of the Year. Taylor Boren of Logan Elementary was named Maryland Elementary Art Educator of the Year. These statewide honors showcase the excellence of our staff even during these challenging times. And as you know, we are in the midst of a long term review, repair and recovery from the ransomware attack. Since my last report to you, we began re-imaging devices, an important process that provides extra protection protection as we move forward. Uh, I experienced some of your concerns when I myself visited a device re-imaging site and with the listening to feedback, we were able to reset and pivot and we are making improvement to support our families and staff. Before the break, teachers were prioritized for device re-imaging and we are now offering device re-imaging for our high school students by appointment. As a reminder, there is no evidence of data theft or exfiltration. Um, if you are contacted by someone claiming to have your personal information, please save anything that you can share and save and share it with the police and call 911 to report the crime. We have assured families that we are working hard to develop solutions to restore our systems. Um, families are now able to register students through the Focus Parent Portal an update regarding report cards and transcripts will be provided to families this week. We are also preparing for virtual magnet assessments now expected to take place in February um, and we'll share details as soon as they are available. So for staff, while we rebuild our payroll system, uh, we have paid our staff and based based on the last paycheck before the ransomware attack. The staff section of the website provides information about last month's special open enrollment and retirement contributions, and our news hub provides more details about payroll. As issues arise, please remember that families and staff have two ways to request tech support by phone or through an online form. Access tech support right from www.bcps.org. Dr. Brian Scriven, our Chief Administrative and Operations Officer, oversees many of the departments that provide our operational infrastructure. And I would like to thank him and his staff for their dedication and commitment to supporting students, families, schools, and staff. Once again, I want to thank this community for withstanding one obstacle after another, yet always thinking first of our students. We are certainly looking ahead to better days. Tonight, based on the guidance, from stakeholders and staff across the system, I will present 
to the board my proposed budget for the 2021 to 2022 school year. I look forward to this next phase in our budget process. So thank you. That concludes my report. Thank you for that, Dr. Williams. And the next item on the agenda is the board chair's report, which will be my report. And in the interest of time, I'm going to save my comments for board member comments. So with that, um, the next item on the agenda is um, the student member of the board's report, Mr. Mahomza. Good evening, Madam Chair, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. Firstly, I want to wish all of you a happy new year. I hope that everyone was able to relax and enjoy time with their loved ones during the holiday break. This week, the 8th of January, will be the deadline for application of next year's student board member position. For those students applying for the position, remember to have all application components turned in before the deadline. During the holiday break, Samantha Warfel, BCPS interim president, and I hosted an Instagram live uh, session to answer questions about the position. I was happy to see many students being engaged about the small role in student government. I look forward to reviewing uh, the applications and getting the 2021 uh, elections kicked off. Tomorrow, I will be hosting a student focus group for middle and high school students. Uh, this focus group uh, is will, will allow me to garner uh, information uh, feedback about online learning and other related topics uh, for our student from our students, so I can share that with our school leaders and partners. Special thanks to Dr. Renard Adams and the curriculum office for sponsoring these focus groups. As I'm halfway through my SMOB ter uh, term, I recognize the fact that there's a lot more work to be done. These next couple of months, I'll be working arduously to voice for the issues that were on my campaign agenda. These issues that are so important to many students in our school system. Finally, I just want to say th uh, these last few words. Last year was a testing period for our community. With so many challenges, we had to find ways to meet them and persevere. From our students, teachers, school leaders, and families, Team BCPS had to deal with a calamitous uh, pandemic and an unfortunate cyber attack. Not to mention having to address the inequities uh, that many of our students currently face and which have only been exacerbated by this pandemic. With all that has been done, we still have much, much more work to be uh, to do. I want to reassure our students and families that I and many of our colleagues have read your countless letters to us. For those suffering, we hear you and empathize with you. It goes without saying that the success of our of the school system and the, and, and the mandate for our school leaders to lead is all done to and on behalf of our stakeholders support. Those that have a loud voice and those ha that have no voice. I recognize that we're not in a normal school year and we might not see normal for a long time. I've been cognizant of the health metrics being published by our government and medical professionals and the data is uh, very concerning. I also can't be oblivious to the plights of our families who have been severely affected by the closure of school. Each day I'm praying for the for that light at the end of the tunnel. Praying for the house uh, for the school house, house doors to once again open. I'm praying so that we can safely commence in person learning once again. That day will come and I hope I will be there for it. But since we're still uh, learning virtually, I'll continue to speak with students uh, and relay concerns to our school leaders so that we can best provide, uh, so that we can provide the best education to our students with the uh, limits that are imposed on us. Thank you all. Thank you for that, Mr. Mahomza. Okay, the next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session and for that I call on Mr. Brusades. Good evening Madam Chair, 
No action taken to report. Thank you for that, Mr. Brusades. Okay. All right. And the next item on the agenda is contract awards. And for that, I call on Ms. Hen, Chair of the Building and Contracts Committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the board, the board's Building and Contracts Committee met earlier this evening. Items J1 through J3 and J5 are being forwarded to the full board for approval. Item J4 was removed from the agenda this evening as it is being amended and will be brought back to building and contracts. Okay, and Ms. Hen, so just, um, so J1 through J3 and J5. Yes, and oh. Madam Chair, we may need advice from Council as to whether we need a motion to remove item J4 from the agenda as that was not considered this evening. Okay, Mr. Mercedes, could you please advise? Yes, that would be appropriate. Okay, then. So do I have a motion then to remove um, J4 from um, so, Ken? So move, Mac. Thank you. Second, Hen. Thank you. OK, so then do I have a motion to approve items J1 through J3 and J5? Ms. Scott, point of order, you need to vote on the removal of the item first. Oh, I apologize for that. Thank you for that, Ms. Jones. Um, Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please, on the removal Ms. of Brown. item J4? Ms. Brown? Madam Chair. This is Ms. Causey. I have a question related to that item. To item J4? Yes. Yes, Ms. Causey, go ahead. Thank you. Um, can I ask why that is being removed? Yes, Ms. Hen. The information the committee was provided is that it's being amended and will be brought back to the next um, building and contracts committee meeting. I don't Thank have you. any further information. Ms. Scott, I have a question. Yes, Ms. Jose. Um, can Ms. Hen explain why it's being amended? It looks like it's a contract for our um, oral arguments and hearing examiners. Um, what is the reason behind it, it being amended? If Mr. Saris is available, he might be able to answer that. That is all the information we were provided, Ms. Jose. Okay, yes. thank you. Um, with, uh, there is um, some discussion ongoing uh, between uh, BCPS and the county government regarding legal services. And uh, as a result of, of that ongoing conversation, uh, we will amend this exhibit accordingly and bring it back to the board. Okay, thank you, Mr. Saris. Yes, thank you, Mr. Saris. You're welcome. Any additional discussion? Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahamza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. OK, now do I have a motion to approve items J1 through J3 and item J5? So, so moved. Move back. Back. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Um, may I have a roll call vote, please? I, I have I'm a sorry. question. Oh, I apologize. Excuse me. Any discussion? So is that Miss? Um, is that uh, I believe Mr. Kuhn? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, you. Miss Scott. 
So I have a question about the contract regarding the busing. Um, uh, number five, there's a modification to school bus routes, regular and summer. Can someone explain this to me? I'm, 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 I'm not quite sure why we are expending and, and increasing this at this time. Uh, so this is Mr. Saris, and uh, we uh, expect that by the end of this year, uh, we will exceed the current spending authority of $62.5 million. And so um, a, a new contract will uh, be presented to the board. It will not take effect until July 1st of 2021. And so uh, we'd like, we're requesting permission to increase this spending authority to see us through the current fiscal year. So just so that we're clear, this is this is contract busing, correct? This is in our own bus drivers and our own buses. This is paying contractors at this point in time. Why why would we utilize this contract when none of our buses are currently active or working and we have are you are you concerned that we're going to open back up and then we're going to immediately run out of money before June? Uh, there, there are two. There are two issues of concern for us. Uh, the first is that, um, as you point out, uh, we really cannot accurately predict when schools will open. Um, but apart from that fact, uh, since March of this year, we have negotiated a memorandum of understanding with the contract bus service providers to uh, give them partial payments so that they will be able to uh, remain in business and begin serving our students at whatever point uh, they are needed because they're a critic they're now a larger uh, component of our routes um, it's increased over 50 percent uh, over the past five years and uh, were these operators to fail and go out of business uh, we would not be able to open schools with our current level of service. So what what exactly does the MOU say and how much are you paying these contractors at this point? Uh, we're paying approximately half of what we would otherwise be paying them to cover uh, their fixed costs and their debt service on capital equipment and their facilities. Uh, and we adjust for their labor and their fuel and their maintenance costs. So are you paying them for main, for labor at this point? No, that's part, part of the agreement is to adjust for that. Okay, I guess my question is, you know, we're, we're watching, we're in the middle of a pandemic and I can understand, you know, the, the idea of keeping, you know, an important contractor around. Uh, but unfortunately, they're not providing any service and we're still paying them. And at the same time, if we're not paying for the labor, then all the people that work for the, the contractors are in essence unemployed. So you're literally keeping a company on life support. Are they taking advantage of PPP loans to pay their employees? Or I, I'm curious uh, as to what's going on here because I don't understand why we would pay a contractor that isn't doing any work. Uh, we're aware that a few of them took advantage of the PPP program. Um, and uh, and part of the agreement is that if uh, 
if those payments, uh, you know, we have a right to recover those payments from them if if they are more than uh, than what we have uh, paid them. And it looks like the anticipated spend is seventeen and a half million dollars this year, which is more than previous previous contract years. Why? Why is it so high? Well, that's simply what we would spend in a full year. Obviously, we've spent uh, much less than that year to date. Uh, this this exhibit was prepared uh, before the December payment was made on the 28th. And so year to date expenditures are just under $4 million. And if nothing else changes and we remain closed, uh, we'll probably spend uh, eight or $9 million by the end of the year. But uh, I can't tell you exactly what, I, what we're gonna spend uh, without knowing when school will open. But we, at this point, we will not spend $17.5 million. Okay. Okay, thank you for that, Mr. Kuhn. Um, and I want to make sure everyone is, has the opportunity to ask the question. So um, next I have Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to dovetail my questions with Mr. Kuhn because <clears throat> um, one of the thoughts is that Baltimore County Public Schools has more buses than we have drivers. And while it may be unfortunate if uh, a transportation company would go out of business um, during the pandemic. Um, hopefully they can have the PPE that Mr. Kuhn was referencing, but perhaps those drivers could be encouraged to apply to BCPS to be our full-time drivers, uh, which would allow us more efficiency in planning our routes. So, um, Mr. Sayers, can you confirm that we have more buses than drivers currently? Hey, hey um, Mr. Sarris, let's yeah. Let's let I can't Dr. really Jones answer Jones. that. George, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, let's let Dr. Grimm jump in and fill that question, please. Right. And add a little more context, Dr. Grimm. Uh, sure. Good evening. Um, so, just to kind of clarify the the question that was asked regarding the payment. Um, in many of our neighboring uh, contracted uh, partners or, or jurisdictions around us, um, their contracts stipulate that there's a guaranteed rate of, say, 180 school days. So the contractors get paid um, for that rate in time. Many of them have successfully negotiated with their contractors so that they could pay a lesser rate, again, to, to keep them solvent. So that's been our goal in, in trying to do that. Um, Ms. Causey, in regard to your question, um, we do operate uh, with our contractors about 1,055 total buses um, at any given time. Um, as far as your question, do we have more buses than we have drivers? Um, I'd have to go back and, and look at the exact numbers of that. Um, our drivers and attendants combined, we do have more of those staff, obviously, than we have buses. Thank you for that. Um, so, and I guess my final question, because it wasn't clear, is this already agreed to by the memo of understanding? Is paying 50% a requirement of the memo of understanding? Um, actually, it's it's not exactly 50%. Uh, As Mr. Sarah said, it's, it's actually on average about 50%. It's a formula that takes into account each specific uh, contractors uh, situation and um, the the number of years of buses that they have, for example, that are under five years old, how many routes that they have with us. And so we have um, we, we've come up with, as he indicated, a formula so that a contractor that services, say, 40 to 50 of our routes um, gets obviously a different payment than a contractor that services um, only five or six of our routes. We have contractors right now that that have provide us with five or six buses 
and we have others that provide us for regular bus routes of close to 50. Um, some of our contractors are, are utilizing the payments that we're giving them differently because their needs are a little bit different. Um, so there isn't a one size fits all of, of how those folks are actually using the money. So to answer your question, it's it is not a guaranteed uh, 50 uh, percent. What we have, the agreement that we've entered in says that we will use this formula um, and it's consistent with other jurisdictions around us to help them stay afloat during the pandemic. OK, thank you. So this memo of understanding was not presented to the board for approval. It was approved by the superintendent. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am, that is correct. It was a recommendation that was made and subsequently we moved forward uh, with the superintendent's uh, authorization uh, to make sure that we were uh, securing these contractors uh, in preparation for reopening. Uh, because to be quite honest with you, uh, we were fearful that if we did reopen, we would not have the contractors uh, to subsequently meet the number of routes uh, to meet the needs of students. Thank you. And was this document provided to the board as a point of information in board docs? I do believe that uh, there was uh, some type of communication around this, uh, but I would need to research and I could definitely uh, give you a follow up to that and to the full board. Thank you, because the other memo of understandings are public information that's on the website. Is that correct? Oh, is that the and, two minute mark? Okay. <laughs> um, is that possible that Ms. Causey's questions could be sent to her in an email, um, Mr. Scri Dr. Scriven? Uh, yes, ma'am, without a doubt. We can provide clarity on that question. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, I believe I got in under the buzzer, so I think the answer is helpful for the full board and the public. Do you, Doug, um, Dr. Scriven, do you have the answer for Ms. Causey at this yes, time? My, my, yes, my response, okay. no, I do not have an answer to the question. I did state that we will research and get back with an update to her question, uh, which we will also provide to the full board. Okay, thank you for that, Dr. Scriven. Thank you. Okay, any additional discussion or questions? Okay, um, Ms. Scover, um, uh, I guess where we left off um, on a roll call vote. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Excuse me, Ms. Gover, is this for just the one contract or the three that are together? The three that are together. It's, yes. I believe it's four. Excuse it's, me, yes. It's um, J1, one, two, three, and J3, and J5. Is it too late to separate out the bus contracts yes. from the others? There's a motion well, on the floor. Yeah, there's a motion on the floor that's been seconded. So we had already started the voting on that. Just fucking vote. So, excuse me, point of order. Watch your language, Mr. Hoffman. Okay, excuse me, board members. If we could remind people. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, uh, point of order, Ms. Rowe. If I could make sure that we as board members keep um, our composure and uh, mode of decorum in how we speak and conduct ourselves in a board meeting. Um, certain outbursts and statements are unbecoming of um, members of the board. So I would like to remind members of that as well. Um, we were in the process of doing a roll call vote. Ms. Gover, if you could please start from the beginning. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Abstain. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. 
Ms. Pesher? Yes. Mr. Q? No. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Scott? Yes. Favor is nine. Thank you for that, Ms. Gober. Okay, and the next item on the agenda is the report on board policies. And for that, I call on Ms. Causey, Chair of the Policy Review Committee. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the board, the Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's recommendation to amend the following board policies. And I'm going to request that, excuse me, I'm going to uh, ask the board to vote on them one at a time because I understand um, Ms. Pasture has a uh, amendment and I have a uh, comment about the last one. So right. we, ask, we ask the Policy Review Committee asks the board to accept this report of the committee's recommendation to amend the following board policy. Number one, policy 1290, closing of school buildings renamed and renumbered to policy 7610, permanent closure of a school building. Okay, so may I have a motion to approve um, the first policy 1290? So moved, Ro. Okay. Is there any discussion, Ms. Causey? None for me, thank you. Okay, may I have a roll call vote, please, for policy 1290, Ms. Gover? Ms. Ro? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. And may I have a motion to approve policy 6000? Actually, Ms. Scott, if, if I can uh, process that for the board, um, because Ms. <clears throat> uh, Pasture wanted to add an amendment. So could we call on Ms. Pasture to uh, speak to the board? Oh, Ms. Pasture, um, are you available to speak to policy 6000? Yes, I am. I'm ready. I, I did send you a communication that I wanted to speak on it. Um, you will all remember that at the last meeting, uh, I brought this up. We voted on it uh, in the affirmative to add an amendment under standards, and it would be letter D. Dr. McComas wrote it, uh, but I did not have the exact wording, so I would like to offer the exact wording uh, tonight. Know that all parties do have it. Um, that would be um, Ms. Howie, Ms. Cox, Ms. Gover, Ms. Causey, Ms. Scott, Dr. Williams. They all have it, but I wanted to present the exact wording uh, to the board. And uh, Ms. Causey and I discussed that you will see that 2002, which is materials, is similar, but they are companions. And it is important that the standard be there so that the purchase in the future of materials makes sense and is tied to this. So the wording would again come under standards, letter D. All curriculum should include an appropriate blend of digital and print materials for instruction and assessment where appropriate. So okay. I do, um, and, and I'll just have to ask um, you, Ms. Scott or Mr. Brissetti, since we voted to amend it, and I gave uh, the general verbiage at the last meeting, is it appropriate to accept this as is, or do I need to make an amendment, another amendment on which we'll vote to accept this wording? 
this exact word. I would ask, um, yes, this is uh, Ms. Scott. I would ask um, Mr. Mercedes, um, because I thought this language was already included, but this language is what you're saying was not included. And yes. you'd like to add it. So does right. that, um, Mr. Mercedes, require Ms. Pastor making a motion to add that language? I think for clarity's sake, uh, it, it should be done by a motion now. Yes. Yes. Then I move that the wording for policy 6000 uh, under standards be amended to read letter D. All curriculum should include an appropriate blend of digital and print materials for instruction and assessment where appropriate. Second row. That was Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. OK, any discussion? Madam Chair, this is Ms. Causey. I have a question. Yes, Ms. Causey. So in the curriculum committee, uh, or one of the times that it was discussed, um, I just wanted to clarify that the word blend would include the situation where it's zero digital and 100% print or manipulatives, uh, especially our CTE students, they have a variety of different equipment and so forth. Um, and that in some instances uh, with our online learning, for instance, uh, the blend may be 100% digital. So I just wanted to clarify that 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 those two options are represented in the word blend. Blend only, thank you, Ms. Causey. Blend only stipulates that in instruction in, in and of itself, we do not hold one. Um, and I think I explained that at the last meeting. So thank you. So yes, it, it could be one or the other. It could be, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional discussion? OK, um, Ms. Gover, may we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Ms. Rowe's phone, she's having phone problems. You may need to come back to her. Ms. Quasi? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pastor? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Mm. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. OK, so um, I guess I would ask Mr. Rossetti, so since that came out and um, Mrs. Pastor amended it now, do we vote on approving um, policy 6000? With the with the change or the motion that Ms. Pastor made? Yes, thank you. OK, OK, so then do I have a motion to approve policy 6000? So, so moved, moved, Mac. Oh, second, Mac. Thank you. Excuse me, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, I was going to make the recommendation to the board that we delay this uh, until the next meeting. Uh, there were specific recommendations in the Office of Legislative Audits November 2020 report related to uh, curriculum procurement. Uh, where I needed to make some additional inquiries as to um, how that language would be suggested. Uh, so I would just want it to make the motion that we postpone this to the next meeting. Postpone you, policy 6000? 6, 6002. No, we haven't got it. Oh, oh wait, I'm sorry. We're at 6002, yeah, we're at 6000. I'm ahead of myself. <laughs> OK. So yeah, so we were taking the roll call for policy 6000. So um, if we could start again, Ms. Gower, please. Ms. Rowe? Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? 
Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Joe? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. OK, now we are on to policy 6002. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to make a recommendation that we postpone approval of this policy until the next meeting for the reasons I earlier suggested. Hey, um, can, you, can she repeat them, Ms. Scott, please? Yes, if you could repeat the reasons, Ms. Calsey, please. Thank you. Certainly, in the Office of Legislative Audit report issued on November 24th, 2020, the Office of Legislative Audits had uh, findings and recommendations related to procurement, and um, I needed additional time to contact them and make sure that the recommendations they're suggesting are included properly. All right, does, um, and I'd ask Mr. Mercedes, does that need to be in the form of a motion? If, if it's being pulled, I would say yes. Okay. Madam Chair? Yes. Given that, those circumstances, um, would is that it be Ms. appropriate Rowe? to make, yes. Given those Please. circumstances, would it be appropriate to move the policy back to committee? I feel that it would be appropriate. Um, it would require a motion. I move to, uh, I'm sorry, could someone give me the policy number again? Is it 6002? That is correct. I move the policy 6002 be returned to the PRC committee for further review based on the OLA audit recommendations. Second, <laughs> Mac. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Scott. Discussion? Yes. yes. Ms. Pastor, is that you? Yes, it is. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I would like Ms. Causey to, if it's going back to PRC, uh, but it is relevant to curriculum and instruction, uh, I would certainly like uh, the committee, the CNI committee, along with staff, uh, to be a part of any discussion. And I think uh, Ms. Causey would, would agree in the sense that 6,000 6, came up in PRC and we agreed uh, that when the two committees are able to collaborate in, in terms of our discussion of them, then we can just move things along expeditiously. So I would appreciate it if uh, C and I were privy to the things that are of concern to Ms. Uh, Causey, or of interest, I should say. Thank you, Ms. Pasture, and I think it would be a great recommendation for uh, Dr. McComas and other members that she uh, determines from curriculum and instruction to attend the policy review committee. And as always, you're welcome to attend and uh, provide discussion. Thank you for that. But can Any we can we have discussion? Oh, yes. Yes, I, I would like at least to have that heads up about the area of concern so that we don't come and waste your time. We don't come um, empty headed and empty handed, if you will. That way we can all have a meaningful uh, dialogue about it. Certainly, Ms. Pasture. And what I would do is send an email to uh, the staff liaison for the Policy Review Committee and include uh, Dr. McComas and uh, with a attachment of the Office of Legislative Audit Report. Um, and then we can move forward from there. Thank All you. Right. Thank you very much. Were there any additional questions or discussion from board members whom we have not heard from? 
No, okay. Um, Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? And this is on 6002 to move it back to um, PRC for further discussion and review. Ms. Brown? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Joe? Abstain. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomta? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Tester? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. Madam Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you for that report, Ms. Quasi. <clears throat> All right, and the next item on the agenda is the work session on the proposed FY 2022 County Capital Budget. And for that, I call on Dr. Scriven and Mr. Dixit. Good evening and thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Dr. Williams, Vice Chair, and to our board members. Uh, we are gathered here uh, today in charge with uh, going over uh, the recommendations for the uh, capital uh, budget 2022. Uh, we have worked uh, collaboratively, and when I say that, I'm referencing the Department of of facilities management and strategic planning and members of the uh, county executive's office with uh, reviewing and moving forward these recommendations. Uh, Mr. Dixit uh, has uh, been in front of you and did a My iPass presentation uh, in September uh, where he explained the process. Uh, we were able to field uh, questions uh, up until December 31st, and there were some that were submitted uh, after the 31st. We are prepared this evening uh, to provide responses to those questions that we received uh, up uh, to December 31st, but we'll continue answering the questions that uh, we received after that uh, requested uh, deadline. Uh, Mr. Dixit and team are here uh, with us this evening. And at this time, I will yield the floor to Mr. Dixit, who will go over those responses and then field uh, any other potential questions that members of the board uh, may have. Uh, Mr. Dixit. Thank you, Dr. Scriven, and good evening, Chair Ms. Scott, Vice Chair Ms. Hen, Superintendent Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Happy New Year to all of you before I start. So tonight we are here to share with you the capital program for the Baltimore County Board System. This is the county portion of the capital program. This whole process is complex and we have received a lot of questions and concerns. So I'll share with you some of the details step by step, give you some of the things that we think that help you in understanding it and then feel any questions you might have. Uh, the, the funding for capital program comes in two different ways. One is the state and the other is the county. The state bonds are floated once a year and county does that once every two years. So in a way, county funding supports a state program and a state's program is supported by the county funding. So it's mutually supportive uh, capital program. There are some items that are only supported by county. So if we have to start design or if we have to buy equipment for the school, that comes out of county share of the funds. In general, the county funds is in the range of 60, 65 or 55 percent of the total project cost. So a major portion of the funding comes from Baltimore County. Um, as part of the process, board approves the plan. 
but the funding is provided by Baltimore County and there is no fiduciary uh, uh, rights that Baltimore County school system has to raise funding. So with that little bit of background, board had approved a state program in September. So this program supplements that and there are some differences and I'll take one step at a time, try to explain that. So all of the uh, items which are from priorities one through 16 are identical to what board has already approved. So if you look in your attachment, the priority one through 16 are the same projects that board has approved. This program adds county share uh, to those projects. When you go further down from prior priority 7 th 17 through 20, this has been updated uh, and included the recommendations from my IPAS and the purpose of this exercise is for board to review it and approve it or discuss it. And if you have any questions, we'll be glad to answer that. All of those priorities 17 through 20 uh, Canon Design that was hired by the Baltimore County. They have independently made those recommendations and in a second to refresh your memory, I'll ask Mr. Jim Corns to to put it on the screen so that uh, your memory is refreshed about what recommendations we are talking about. So these were the recommendations that were made about the high school. The first part was that continue with the systemic repair program based on the facility condition assessment. The second slide, Mr. Korn, if you would be kind of to move, is the complete mid-course legacy project, which is those projects that have total design funds fully approved, and that they call their term is legacy project, and that was the Lansdowne High School. So they did not do anything to that project except they continue with that project. The rationale that they gave us and that I share with you because there is nothing they can do with those funds. They have already been allocated and they didn't want to change those priorities. So their plan, their plan starts with after the legacy project, all of the leg legacy projects, including Lansdown. So anything that has been funded for construction or for design fully, they are all they call legacy projects. Third slide, please. The focus of what they said is the big issue with high schools is capacity issues. Board has heard this, uh, this, this thing before and Canon Designs study reaffirmed that in case of high school capacity is the highest priority and two areas of the county southeast southeast region which is dundalk high school and there are two other schools but tapsco and sparrows point those that area has a total seat deficit and to, to simplify that term for the audience here those are the students that are there and we have no classroom space so we call that seat deficit so there's a total seat deficit in that area at currently 632 and is projected to increase to 1,241 students by 2026. And 2026 is important because if we start designing a project now, by the time we design and build a project and go through the review process, it takes anywhere from five to seven years, depending on the size of the project. The addition take little less and the full school or renovation takes a lot longer. So that, just remember that number for, for this conversation, for the sake of this conversation, there will be a seat deficit of 1,241 students in the southeast region of the Baltimore County. Out of that 1,241 student, there will be 657 seats that will be needed in Dundalk High School again. So if we start a project now and we complete, we'll be barely able to 
meet the seat requirement there. That will still leave a deficit of another 641 seats that will be needed in that area. And I'll come, come to that in a second. In the northeast side, again, according to my IPAS, Cannon's program, uh, there'll be a seat deficit uh, in the northeast central region combined of 1149 seats by 2026. I emphasize seat, seat deficit in this conversation means there'll be students and there'll be no classroom space for them. The Towson High School alone is projected to have a seat deficit of 480 seats by 2026. They already at this time have a seat deficit of 359 students. This was the rationale that Canon Design used for an addition to Dundalk at Dundalk High School and to do addition renovation at Towson High School. And I'll talk a little bit about the addition renovation because there were a lot of questions uh, about the Delaney and Towson uh, High School. So I need to spend some time for you to understand what is this conversation and why Canon is recommending that. Now Towson High School is a very special school in that it has a seat deficit, it has a facility condition issue, and on top of that, it is a historical building. So what that means is that we'll have to go through another layer of process during design with extensive involvement of community, presenting options to community, receiving their feedback, and arriving at consensus, consensus on the final design between four different partners. The first partner, key partner being the community itself. The second is the Maryland Historical Trust. The third is the Baltimore County, and the fourth is the state of Maryland for their funding. So this is going to be quite an involved design process. that will take a long time, uh, at least six months to 12 months more than a regular school. Excuse me, excuse me, Mr. Dixon, I'm not trying to interrupt you. I'm, I'm getting messages that the public cannot see the slides that you're speaking to. Mr. Corns, can you can you make this the, the key thing that's being projected so that they can see what he's speaking to? Thanks, Mr. Dixon. I'm sorry for interrupting. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Corns, tell me when I can move. Go ahead, Pete. OK, thank you, sir. So those two projects have been singled out for critical additions. Um, and in the end, if the community preference is going in a different direction than an, addit an addition or a renovation, then we'll come back to the board and present the option where the consensus has been approved. So this was key piece of conversation that I wanted to share with this. Uh, the third piece of conversation that I wanted to do that what Canon has indicated to us that it is a $1.2 billion issue that we are facing. Now, it is important to look at the dollars that are going to be needed to fix high school problems alone. $1.2 billion only for the high school. And if you look at the cash flow or the money coming in every year, on an average, state has been providing us 40 million, and on an average, county has raised the money from 70 million per year to 100 million per year now. So their $200 million bond for two years provides us $100 million. At the rate of $140 million per year, if we put all of the money in high school, which is one third of the square footage for the school system, it will take more than 10 years to fund all of the high school issues. So that is the magnitude of the problem. So what they have indicated to us in their recommendation. That it is in our interest to make use of existing building and renovate. So the two key message that we got from high school recommendations from Canon that renovate building unless you absolutely cannot do it and that take care of the capacity issues 
as soon as you can. So those were, I thought, the key things that we wanted to share with you, and I'll come back later on to uh, address any questions. Uh, as we go down the, the priorities further down, which is 21 through 42, this is part of the systemic renovation. Simplifying systemic means these are building systems. For example, leaking roofs. Roof is a building system. For example, replacing boilers and chillers, aging boilers and chillers. These are building system. They are just as just as important, if not more, as the building renovation itself. So there is a stream of funding that is needed to take care of those systemic improvements. So priorities 21 through 42 are for roofs, boilers and chillers. They were included in the state request that board has approved and the county approved just shows the county share of the project. I do want to acknowledge um, superintendent's team's working relationship with the county team. Whenever we have needed money for systemics, they have provided it to us. If there is an emergency, they have provided additional funding for us. If there's any shortfall due to change in the bid or the bid prices, they have done that. So I just want to take this opportunity to acknowledge that. Now, um, the, the piece that we are asking in addition to these two additions is taking a deeper dive on the northeast side and taking a deeper dive into the southeast side. Now, while we are saying that half about approximately half the needs can be taken care of by these two additions, the other half seats we still have to worry about. We still have to take care of them. And there comes the issue of where do we build? What do we build? Or we build a renovation. And where is the site? And how do we take care of that? So that needs further exploration on the southeast side because the schools. Uh, next slide, please, if you have it. And this is the slide where the uh, Canon design has said that after one year of stakeholder engagement and land due diligence, determine whether to build relief schools or more additions. There is tremendous future need for the seats in the northeast and central area. What is the most optimum solution? And what is the most doable solution within the limitations of the funding? That's the challenge that we have to face. Are the sites available? On the south southeast side, you look at a Sparrows Point, and in the ratings that Canon Design has shared with us, they have indicated that Overall aggregated need score based ranking, uh, ranking for Sparrows Point is the worst. And that has to do with not only the condition, but because of the educational adequacy and the capacity score. So something needs to be done there pretty soon in order to take care of those needs. So that takes care of my uh, I think most of the item. The other thing that I wanted to share with you is um, the schedule that is an attachment to, to this thing here. Um, we had introduced county capital program to you in the December 22nd meeting. Tonight is the work session. In the next meeting, we'll uh, ask for your approval for our process, and then it is required to be submitted to Baltimore County. A similar discussion will take place with the county council. And then there'll be hearing uh, public hearing by the county council in April 2021. And there'll be a budget work session again by the county council. And then county council adopts the budget in May 2021. So with that, my part of the presentation is done. We have received some questions and we keep getting questions. A lot of our questions are for Delaney and for Towson area. And I, I make this statement from my heart. 
that there are eight schools that are need in need of replacement or renovation and that we feel for them that we are doing everything that we can and we'll continue to, to do that. But we have to take one step at a time. So the questions that that we have already received uh, about the my access to my iPass information, we sincerely regret uh, the situation that ransomware has caused where our website has been impacted. Uh, it is my understanding that with the arrangements we have made with the county, they are preparing a website so that communities have direct access to same information on the Baltimore County website until such time that we take care of our website. And Mr. Korn's team is working very diligently for us to have that access very soon. So um, there were questions about what we did with the $500,000 for Delaney and 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 uh, Towson High School. As part of the pre-planning process, we are always looking at what work is needed during the design period. Uh, the the design our our processes are time constrained. So once we get the approval for design, there is certain amount of time where the design has to be completed, and then there is certain amount of time that the bids have to be the contract has to be awarded. So we strictly follow those timelines, and the five hundred thousand dollars were were spent on doing the uh, doing the survey the. The environmental related issues were investigated and also there were some issues about what is the process for historical trust compliance in case of Towson. So about half the funding was uh, spent on that and the unspent amount is still with the county uh, with, with the county and will be utilized for future projects. There was a question about life cycle costing and I just want to talk for a second about life cycle costing. Life cycle costing is done when design starts. State requires that and for that we got to have the design funds approved by the uh, county and the, a, a, a design team has to be selected following board guidelines before we complete that and that will be done uh, uh, for all of the renovation addition projects. Uh, and that's most of the questions and now I'll be and what one question was about the when can what is the best case scenario when Lansdowne High School construction will start? So. For any construction to start uh, in the, the project that you that, that you see on your spreadsheet there. The design work is progressing satisfactorily. I do want to give a shout out here to our, our design team that all of the design work is on schedule and we'll have it completed by the end of this year or early next year and we are waiting for state funds. Again, thanks to county. They have provided funding for all of the projects. Above Lansdown High School and we are uh, hoping that in the next fiscal year or so, we'll be able to get funds for Lansdowne High School, but that will only be the county share. We still have to get a state share before we start the project, so we cannot speculate any date as to when it's going to come, but it's at least four, five, six years away from now, but our design will be complete by then. So with this, uh, I'll leave the floor open for your questions. I know I have taken more time than I intended to uh, and uh, uh, I'll be more than glad to answer questions. If I don't have the answers, I'll get back to you and send the responses in a Friday letter. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Dixit. The um, uh, first question is from Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, Mr. Dixit, um, as I look at the January 5th <clears throat> slide that you provided, with the changes, with the removal of Delaney and the changes associated with Towson High, I'm concerned um, that this this change occurred when we've already voted and supported the previous 
um, capital budget request and it's being modified um, before we've approved any kind of modification. So I know that I, I, you know, I don't really have you know, a direct question there except to say who did you physically make the change to this um, this request that it, that we're looking at right now? OK, so there are two parts to this response. Number one, if you look at the note five in this in the in the state capital uh, fiscal year 22. It very clearly indicates that Lane and Towson High School schools will be determined after the board's review of the recommendations from the multi year improvement plan for all all schools being prepared in cooperation with our county fiscal partners. So all along for the last couple of years, the only project that was for certain approved was Lansdown and the remaining two projects. We were all waiting for the multi year plan that board had advocated for. Well, Mr. Dixit, we had approved all of the high schools. The funding for Lansdown was provided. That was the change. So and we were waiting for my past to come along and show us a recommendation, but we haven't adopted any of those recommendations and we're still waiting for the next part of them. So I'm 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 asking as to why after having Delaney and Towson up there for new schools, why we you know, after being told don't change your request, don't change your request. The state likes it to be, you know, stable and not changing all the time. And we listened and we we didn't make any changes and we were, we were moving forward. Um, why that change occurred? Is it simply because my past recommendations were handed to you and therefore you inputted them into the spreadsheet? This the spreadsheet is not one person, not any one person's work. This Who made is, the decision then to this, make the change, Mr. Dixon? In, in all, when we develop these plans, it is the superintendent's team and county executive team that work together to work together to come up with the plan for you to review and approve. So tonight we are incorporating my IPAS recommendation and we there is no adoption of my IPAS. IPAS is being conducted by Baltimore County and it is a recommendation to Baltimore County and any recommendations that are made in there, they are being incorporated for your consideration and for your work as part of the plan. Okay, I I can't support this as provided since you have removed a lady which is in a tremendous need of a new school and the fact that Towson adding an addition is, is a ridiculous fix to this. Um, I do support Southeast area and the Northeast area. Okay. They definitely need uh, the schools to be available. Uh, so, you know, as we move forward this, I appreciate you making this clear as to how this works so that everybody understands. I'm sorry, there's a timer, Mr. P. <laughs> right, well, when I'm asking a question, that is my time. And when he's answering, it is his time, not my time. That is correct. Yes. The timer, um, just to make sure we're only timing when we're asking a question, not in the response. Um, so the, the timer is not for um, when Mr. Dixit responds. It's just for us when we ask questions of the staff. But um, Mr. Dixit, any additional questions can um, Mr. Kuhn, I'm sure, email those to Dr. Williams and you and Dr. Kuhn. So that you can have Absolutely. answers and responses to those. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. OK, and um, next we have Miss Joes. Thank you, Miss Scott. Thank you, Mr. Dick Shit. Um, so from what I remember right, the Canon group was pushed because certain members on the board did not like the uh, recommendations that were coming forward. So this was an independent study done by an independent consultant, which has cost the taxpayers over $1 million. Um, and so my question to you, Mr. Dixit, you know, it's troubling to me that Dundalk High School and Towson are projected to have 650 and 480 seats deficit respectively. As a planner, that thing causes panic in me. I have no political agenda, but it's important to do the right thing. And if you uh, 
you know, fail to plan right now, then we should plan to fail because that is literally six years we have left and we all know that it takes between uh, gosh, seven to eight years between planning, design, construction and approval of the construction and for the schools to reopen. So correct me, Mr. Dixit, if we miss this request for Towson and Dundalk design money, this will be further delayed, correct? That's correct. And so, you know, can you also verify the enrollment numbers? Because, you know, I'm hearing this to a lot of people saying enrollment numbers. These are verified by the Maryland State, correct? Yeah, the, the process we use for enrollment projections is that our staff working, they, their, their process is independently verified by a private consulting company. And also, Maryland State has checked our planning numbers, our enrollment projections. So it's not that only one part, only one organization is coming up with projections. So I, I need to emphasize that the enrollment projections have a high accuracy. Our annual enrollment are 99.5% accurate. We use a standard cohort survival method and it is verified by Maryland Department of Planning and they make sure that we are within 5% of those prepared by the Maryland Department. So it is not just our organization doing it. And I'm going back to your original remark about the million dollar uh, study. Mm -hmm. I do want to thank our board that advocated for that study, for independent study. So these recommendations are coming from an independent consultant that we are incorporating here and it is for your approval. Now also I need to clarify here that this is our opportunity to get design funds. So design is the first part even before it is the foundation of any any project. If we miss design funds this year that means those two projects are going to be further delayed. So I do want to emphasize that the numbers. Dundalk High School has a seat deficit of 657 seats by 2026. And Towson High School has a seat deficit of um, uh, 486 Eight. by 2026. So if you push it down further, uh, uh, you just you just said what you, what you said, and that is absolutely correct. And and Sparrow's point, I see that didn't make the cut because that is a middle school and a high school together, and that is troubling as well since it's in a peninsula and it is going to be overcrowded. So we have to make equitable decisions, and we have to meet the need, needs of all of our schools countywide. We should all consider ourselves member at large. Uh, because when you know the lowest amongst us rise, we all rise. As a planner, we should take politics out of it. And I apologize because I know you didn't make that list yourself you were accused of. That is something that was collaboratively put together between a team of people who do this for a living and the county. Correct, Ms. Dixit? Absolutely, because this notion that is out there, there is that one person is doing this, it is just absolutely false. Uh, you know, I can't uh, be more vehemently denying that. It's, it's county planners involved, it's our strategic yes. planning involved, it's our, 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 our folks involved that are developing budget, and it's the finance from the former county. We all work together, and it's not one person that's pulling it out. So I just yes. wanted to be very clear about that. Thank you for asking. I, I get that, I get that. So I apologize when um, I heard that comment. So thank you for this presentation, uh, Mr. Dixit, and um, that's all. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Next, we have Ms. Mack. Ms. Mack? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Um, I have just a few questions and a couple of comments. Um, you talked about Lansdowne, and we've had this conversation before, and I, I think you just said that you, you can't even give a best estimate, but are we looking at seven years? Are we looking at 10 years? Um, can you give me a ballpark for Lansdowne, which is the only high school with planning and design money? Any response that I give you will be speculative 
because we don't know when the state funds are coming. So if you allow me to put a qualifier in there. And that would say, be perfect. Thank you. So if we assume that a state funding will come at the same rate that they have come and the construction funds from the county are available, then the earliest will construction will start is July of 2026 uh, with the opening in September 30. And if the if the state funds are I'm sorry, now, Mr. Dixit, with the opening when in in September uh, 2030. OK, and so thank you very much for that. So I mean, that's very, very concerning to hear. I understand that you do not have control of it, um, but if if Lansdowne is the only school on the list with planning and design money. Um, how can we possibly how can it possibly make sense to anybody to talk about a renovation of Towson High School, which is grossly overcrowded? Um, it's over 80 years old already. And so now we'll add another 10 years um, possibly to even that. And they don't even have planning and design money. As we as we sit here, there's degradation to the building as time goes on. It just to me is throwing bad, um, good money after bad, and I could never support that. And then finally, to Mr. Um, um, Kuhn's point, I have I had a whole binder from the last time we talked about this, and it is very concerning to me that a school like Delaney that was on this list for good reasons, and I have all the reasons that were given to us at the time. I even have the county executive's school construction challenge sheet that shows Delaney as needing a replacement. How can a school like Delaney just fall off the list? I'm not advocating that anything should come off the list, but I think we need to ask for what we need, and we need schools everywhere. And to take a school like Delaney off the list, I would never support that. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so um, next we have um, Ms. Causey. Um, Ms. Scott, wasn't I first? Oh, excuse me. Thank you for that. I apologize, Ms. Rowe. You were next. OK, thank you. So um, in September, the state IAC awarded a contract that will take one year to complete to assess all schools in the state in a similar manner, but with different waiting standards than my IPAS concerning facilities conditions. And Mr. Dixit, we've been told by you that we needed to wait for the county assessment to remove or add projects. And while I have no objection to adding projects to the bottom of the priority list, as this request does, that have legitimate needs, as the added projects do, why are we removing Delaney and downgrading Towson prior to the completion of the state assessment since it's not far off. Shouldn't we wait to remove or downgrade projects until the assessment is complete, given that you have repeatedly told us that it's unwise to make significant changes to the county request when the state request for the same year is being considered by the state, as you have told this board every year for the past two years? Why not leave them on the request until the state finishes, finishes its assessment at the very least? OK, so I can only say that the concept of my IPAS was not a superintendent's concept. This came from, it started from the board that we need an independent plan, a long range plan from the board side and work with county. At that time, there was no state assessment and all of these assessments they are independent assessments. So how many times are we going to assess buildings? Do we know now? Do we know for sure that there are eight buildings that are in need of replacement or renovation? And, and the state assessment, assessment does not take care of educational adequacy. So this is the first time that we have done an assessment. Thanks Baltimore County for that. That includes physical condition, that includes capacity utilization and that includes includes educational adequacy and equity. State assessment is not going to do that. Mr. So, Dixit, the, the Adequate Public Facilities Act was passed two years ago 
and those adequate um, school facilities standards do in fact cover educational adequacy, school facilities condition, and overcrowding. And the next step in that is the state assessment so that state can rank based on facilities, um, conditions, overcrowding, and educational adequacy, all the schools in the state in an order to be available for state funding. So anyone watching the IAC meetings can see that this is the case. Um, so let me ask you this, if Delaney High School is removed from this list and Towson is downgraded to an addition, please explain exactly how their inadequate facilities needs will be fixed if this board does not ask for the money to do so in our budget request. And should we not be asking for what we need and are these not legitimate needs? So I wish we could fund all of those eight projects that need replacement or renovation. So that's the first thing. Fiscal constraints are for real. None of the projects have been removed. The board wanted an independent assessment, which is what was done. It was board's desire to incorporate schools after Lansdowne based on that independent assessment. So that's the second point. And the third point about the uh, task force on, on building accessibility. Uh, remember, it is a six year six year plan. You start design. It takes 18 months sometimes to complete the design. So if there are changes coming, which are always coming, we have changes in code, code comply, we, we adjust to code. So we have a choice either to wait, keep waiting for all of the work to be done or start designing, de start designing something now that we can, that where, where the funding is available and county has agreed to fund the design of the addition at Dundalk and to fund the uh, design of Towson. Now again saying, I need to emphasize that in case of Towson, it's the community input that's going to decide the future of that design. It is the historical piece that has a major part. So if community wants to preserve that historical architecture part of the building, we'll preserve it. If the, the, the feasibility will, will indicate exactly what's the future of the Towson, but we need to start at some point. We need to start design work at some point to be able to complete it six years. I think Ms. Joes uh, was very clear uh, in her statement that the more we push it behind, the more trouble we are buying at the end of the road. I Mr. hope I answered the question. Mr. Dictit, bless the school system and school staff. <laughs> Thank you. I'll submit oh, more okay. questions later. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So that um, is the mark for that. All right. And next we have Miss um, Causey. Miss Causey, are you there? I am here. Thank you very much. Thank you. So. Um, as other board members have said, the, the state capital request uh, that the board approved in September has had uh, lands down, well, actually, Delaney and Towson on it since 2017. So <clears throat> um, I'm just, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. <clears throat> I'm sorry, <clears throat> I'm gonna have to let someone else go first. Oh, OK, certainly. Mr. Um, Mr. Offerman was next. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, we'll come back to Ms. Causey. Um, Mr. Offerman? Yes, uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Dixit if the if the uh, funds involved for renovating Towson High School only are involved with the cafeteria and the uh, and the kitchen. Is that correct? No, the the renovation work at Towson High School will be for complete renovation of the building. It will be a 21st century uh, educational place. It is not only part of the renovation. It will be a complete renovation of Towson High School and preservation of the uh, architectural part of the building. And 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 also, uh, do you envision at this point that the renovation uh, it would come. It would come before or after we would. Uh, if 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 the board approves this, 
uh, would come before after the building of the uh, of the extra seats. The building of the extra seat will be part of the scope of work. So once the renovation is complete, they will have additional seats and they will have a completely modern 21st century building. And the design of the building will be driven by the community input that we get. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Offerman. Um, Ms. Head is next, uh, but Ms. Causey, um, are you ready to go now or are you OK with Ms. Hen going? OK, I don't hear from Ms. Causey. Uh, Ms. Hen, are you ready to go? Yes, madam. Oh, there we go. Thank, thank you. you. Um, and thank you, Mr. Dixit, um, for answering our questions. I appreciate your time this evening. Um, so in the fall of 2018, um, the last planning effort by Sage Policy Group recommended a new Towson High School, and that recommendation followed an extensive community process, and the community fully supported a new Towson High School um, rather than an addition to Towson High. And that was based on this is the community that knows the site. They know the needs of the school, both in terms of the, the need for additional seats as well as what that site can support. Um, they are aware of the plans recommended by Canon Design. They do not support um, the plans for an, an addition or renovation. They, they recognize that that's limited in scope. Um, as many others have stated, they have been waiting for this. The, the, the school was built in 1949, and as Ms. Mack stated, by the time we get around to constructing it, this recommendation was from three years ago. Um, how do we justify um, downgrading them to a limited renovation when SAGE recommended three years ago that they needed a new school? In 2014, another study was done that said they needed a new school based on their facility condition, and we know they need seats. 25% of the needed high school seats in the county are within Towson's current boundaries, and they they will continue to need new seats based, based on the growth um, trajectory. So can you please comment on why we can justify this plan that, my, that Canon recommends based on these additional studies, which were all very valid and supported by the school system at the time? So you have several questions in there, and I'll try to answer one at a time. Uh, Sage Policy Group is not an architectural company, so that's number one. Number two, uh, the plan that board and county wanted was an independent plan from a leading company, a nationally recognized company. Number three, any design that will be approved will have community backing will have community review. Maryland Historical Trust requires that for any architecturally uh, uh, preserved building or, the, or, or that has architectural, that is on the list for Maryland Historical Trust, several options be presented to community and for community to make the call about the design that is acceptable to them and that funding partners then obviously have to agree that they will fund it. So it has a long design review period, and it is not that some design is going to be imposed on the community. They will be part of it. So Canon was very specific in their recommendation of um, only a new kitchen and cafeteria. So that you speak to this comprehensive and your answer to Mr. Offerman was that this will be a completely modern facility. However, that's not what Canon communicated. Is it your understanding that this renovation that they are recommending is more expansive than what they have communicated? Okay. Yes, and, and Mr. Dixit, um, if you could answer Ms. Hen's question. That would be yes, yes. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. So yes, uh, Canon has started by saying that start the design. It will not be an incomplete design. It will be complete renovation, which will before even before we started designing it, we'll have an educational spec develop. Educational spec 
will define the scope of work for the architect. And once the design starts, it will be shared with the community. And if they don't, if we do not have their buy in, that design will not be implemented. OK, great. Thank you for that, Mr. Dixit. Um, and we had Ms. Causey next. Ms. Causey, are you ready to go? Thank you, Ms. Dodd. I apologize. So there's been a lot of discussion and the, the main issue is that Delaney High School has been on the list since 2017 for very valid reasons, including educational inadequacy given the insufficient square footage based on the student population, as well as the mechanical, in, um, electrical, and plumbing numbers being the second lowest only to Lansdowne High School. And your comments about the community having input, the community has had input for three years around this situation. And in terms of funding partners, both of these schools have received significant uh, support, including the county executive um, and our delegation and the governor and the lieutenant governor and the comptroller and so on and so on. Um, additionally, <coughs> excuse me, um, when you are speaking to a complete renovation, well, we heard that for two years related to Lansdowne, and then the board made it clear that that was not going to be adequate. And so the board asked for a replacement school and the county executive supported that with the funding for planning and design. So <clears throat> the issue too related to other things with the Canon design is based on the projections. And when you speak to 99% accuracy, that is a conglomerate number across the whole district from one year to another year. There has never been, and this is from the Canon Design's own uh, speaking to the board on public record, there has not been an analysis of the accuracy of the projections by each high school, much less one than for another. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I apologize. Um, Was there a a question that you wanted Mr. Dixit to respond to? Thank you for the time. Thank you. Excuse me. No, thank you. Go ahead. Was there a question that Mr. Dixit um, needed to respond to? I am so sorry. I don't know what's happening. <clears throat> the last thing I wanted to say is I am making a motion to restore project line item 17 and 18 replacement Delaney and Towson High Schools from the fiscal year 2022 state capital budget request as line items 17 and 18 to the fiscal year 2022 capital county capital request with specifications. Second, Hen. Fourth. Thank you. I would like to speak to my motion. <coughs> I'm Point sorry. of order, Ms. Scott, this is a work session. We're not making votes during this. We have another session where we will make a vote, I believe, on the 19th. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Jones. Is it and appropriate during the work is, session to make motions? Thank you, Ms. Um, Scott. The purpose of making the motion now is to have staff adjust the document so that at the next meeting, when the board does make final approval, uh, that that final approval will be clear and it will also have time for uh, funding partners and community to understand exactly uh, what the board is asking for. Okay. All right, um, any further discussion? Ms. Rowe, to the motion. Yes, I would like to speak to the motion. Yes. So given that my iPass is not available to the public, I'm unwilling to make a decision to downgrade Towson High School and remove Delaney High School, knowing that adding them back to the list will be difficult and they will lose their priority placement in the list. I'm also unwilling to take projects off the list that have legitimate needs, leaving them in the position of having no solution in any plan whatsoever. The point of a multi-year plan was to meet all needs and to itemize all those needs and when they would be met, and all means all. 
I don't see a high school plan that meets all needs, so I don't support removing or downgrading projects. We need to ask for what we need and also wait for the state assessment. It is not the problem of this board to find the money. We need to ask for what we need because if we don't ask for something, it never gets funded. Let the county executive and the general assembly worry about where to find the money and they can tell us what they're willing or unwilling to fund, but we need to ask for all needs to be met. Thank you. Ms. Jost, you'd like to speak to the motion? Yes, so you know, I, I do like to point out that when the SAGE, Paul, SAGE group did the report, Ms. Kazi and her group did not like that report, um, which is why Ms. Kazi, you pushed for this independent study to be done by an independent consultant, which cost the taxpayer over $1 million. And now you don't like the recommendations these are independent, equitable recommendations based on facts and numbers. I'm not biased against any school again, like I mentioned, uh, but there is a need here that Dundalk High will be 656 seats in deficit, 480 in Towson in 2026, six years. As somebody that does planning, that is not a lot of time to push the scan down the road and to grandstand and make political motions. but. If this is what a group that does this for a living is recommending to come in there and add a new school will actually take dollars away from uh, item 23, which is roof replacement for maybe Randallstown or roof replacement for another elementary school boiler. So that's going to take money away to simply make a statement that there is the money. There's Montgomery County, Harvard County, lots of other counties in Maryland that are going to be also pushing for dollars for their um, planning and their schools as well. So we have to put forward a plan that the state will accept that's equitable, that's fair, and not just centered around Central and Northeast. Northeast is where I live, so full disclosure. It should be equitable to Southeast and Northwest, uh, Lansdowne and Delaney and everybody. So to just make a blanket statement, look at a report and reject it outright because you don't like it and put in something that's coming in from community or Facebook forums. I don't think that's something I will support. I'm going to support the Candle Group's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hen, would you like to speak to the motion? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. When I was appointed to the board in 2016, one of the first pieces of, pieces of advice I received was ask for what you need. This board does not have taxing authority. We need to ask for what we need and ask for what our students need. We are not subtracting from this plan. We are adding to it. That's what this motion does. It asks for what we need. Towson and Delaney need new schools. It's as simple as that. Sage recommended it. Our communities know they need it, and we are asking for what we need. As Ms. Rose stated, we are advocating for the needs of all and all means all. Towson and Delaney need new schools. They need to be on this plan. Thank you. Thank you. God, Anyone like else who would like to discuss and speak to the motion? Mr. McMillian? Yes, please. Mr. Yes, Dixon, please go. I absolutely hate to see communities pitted against each other for capital projects. However, if Delaney and Towson are put back on this list, what happens to the Southeast area high schools and middle schools? Thank you. Mr. Dixit, are you available to answer Mr. McMillian's question? Absolutely. So I do want to remind board that this is not our plan. This is the recommendation from the independent consultant. And the recommendation from independent consultant is that start with the project that you can quickly deliver. You can deliver in short amount of time. Keep working for the projects that are needed but are going to take some time. The Southeast Sparrows Point area and those projects, they need a deeper dive. If we could do it, we, if we could start designing, if we had a site, we would start right now and, and include that also. But the, the two projects that we have on top there, which is the addition to Dundalk, and so we are not putting any community against any community. One is in the southeast, the other is on the north side in the central area. Those two projects do not need a new site. They require the design work. The, the, the design work can be started there and quickly delivered. So this is not putting site. The, the worst rated school, um, Mr. McMillian there is Sparrows Point in the in the my iPass study. If we had a site, 
that would be the first project on the list that you see here, but we don't. So we have to do some more work, and that's why it's not there. Towson is the second one, which is what is on the list. Lansdowne is already on there, and Dundalk Sellers Point is the fourth one. So that's our rationale for including. It is not our recommendation. It is recommendation of the independent consultant. Okay, Mr. Dixon, but I, I don't think you answered my question. If the Laney and Towson, if this motion passes and the Laney and Towson are put back on the list, how does that affect the funding for the Southeast area schools? There is only so much funds to go around. What I can tell you that the plan we have shared with you has, has been shared with county and they have, they have indicated that they will consider it. Now, if that doesn't go through, if you add something else, I don't know. I can't predict how many, funds, how much, how, what's the funding level that county has. So I can't answer that question. Thank you very much. Ms. Scott, if I may, real quick. Uh, yes, Ms. Jo or were there any other board members um, before Ms. Jo, so um, who we have not heard from who would like to speak to this motion or have questions? OK, we'll come back to you, Ms. Joseph. Uh, looks like Mr. Kuhn has a question. Oh, I, I don't have a question. I just I want to, like speak to, speak to, the, to the motion. The motion. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so um, I I would reiterate uh, what Ms. Rowe is advocating for to make additions to this list, not removing anything. Um, we all realize that there are tremendous needs in our county. Uh, regarding school construction, and I think by not removing right the the, the Laney and, and the Towson schools, we're asking for what we need, as well as a southeast area high school that's listed there and a northeast central area high, which should be the Perry Hall area. Um, that's all on this list. Um, so, I, you know, I'm a proponent of adding and asking our politicians to provide the funding as required. I understand this all takes time. It's been moving slow since I've gotten here. And, you know, we're talking about Lansdowne. I think, Mr. Diggs, you just said Lansdowne wouldn't be completed until 2030. Wasn't that just what you just stated? Depending on the That's state. 10 years from now for something that's already on the list and approved. That's and, and, it's, and, it's and such that, a long process. It's just that, challenging absolutely. to understand. And that's why the earlier we start the process, it's a it's a big problem. We have to nibble it at it one at a time and we just can't wait because design itself takes anywhere from 12 to 18 months. So we have two projects here that are included that are recommended by Canon that are supported by county. So it gives us the opportunity to start the design of those projects. Right, and my, and my comments are to add projects and Towson High School and the community supports a new school, not an addition and renovation of a school that's not in good shape, that has 12 plus outdoor, what do we call them, temporary classrooms that have been there for over a decade. We need to address it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Cohn. Um, Ms. Jose, speaking to you want to speak to this motion? Not so much to, to this motion as much as Mr. Um, McMillian's question where he had about what would that do if we added something. The county only has a certain amount of dollars in below line 22. Not point of order. I would rather be more appropriate for staff to answer Mr. McMillian's questions as Ms. Jones is not staff and I believe staff already answered the questions and questions are only. Oh, thank you very much, Ms. Rowe. Ms. Dixit, if you could answer that question. I think he's so if if he will repeat the question, maybe I'll understand it better this time. OK, Mr. McMillian, um, could you repeat your question to Mr. Dixon? I believe he asked um, what would happen to schools in the southeast region if these um, if the schools are added back to the list. Uh, that's a, um, summarizing, but um, Mr. McMillian, are you still there? Yeah, of course I'm here. I'm listening. I'm listening to every word. Thank you. Um, could you um, repeat your question to Mr. Yeah. Dixon, please? I ask if 
Delaney and Towson were added back on the list. Realistically, what does that do to the projects in the southeast area? And I kind of agree with Ms. Joes. There's only a limited amount of money. And, yes. and money wherever it's going to go wherever it goes. And then we're going to run out of it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, not a so, self. Um, yes. Was there another question? It's particularly to this motion. If not, we need to take it to a roll call and to vote. Madam Chair, I had put into the chat that I had not spoken to my motion. Oh, I thought you spoke to it at the very beginning. <clears throat> no, I used my uh, two minutes for the agenda item and then I made the motion <clears throat> and I didn't get to speak to my motion. OK, yes, if you could speak to your motion, please. Um, thank you. Uh, a lot of very important points have been made, uh, but the most important point is that it is the board's responsibility to ask for what we know is going to provide the best benefit for our students as well as being fiscally responsible. My uh, students and many other students have gone through renovations in place. They take longer to complete. They are more costly and they are also dangerous. In a renovation in place at Hereford High School, an air conditioning unit fell through the roof into a classroom, breaking open sprinkler pipes and ruining uh, a music room where students were no longer able to uh, take music for the rest of that uh, school year. So when we're speaking about needs and can't wait, Towson High School, that can has been kicked down the road and they are the most consistently, chronically and crippling overcrowded school right now, not a projection. In addition to the facility scores, it is, it is, Delaney, it has been vetted by, as I said, funding partners, uh, state, local, um, you name it. The other issue is um, other board members have said that we shouldn't pit communities against each other, but that is exactly what would be happening if Delaney is removed completely, asking for nothing for them to help them with all of the documented needs, and then pushing Towson to a inadequate renovation because we've seen that and the board rejected that for Lansdowne and now Lansdowne is getting built. Additionally, for Towson, they have the a very small campus size and to say that you're going to add an addition when it also has an environmentally sensitive stream, I, you know, I don't even see how that works. Um, so there's been a lot of discussion. The last thing I will say is for the Canon design. OK, we have time. Results, <laughs> All right. Yeah, we have time. So maybe someone um, else can pick that up related to how the yeah, uh, well, we need to take it metrics involved. were involved. OK, thank you for that, Ms. Causey. So um, I believe we've spoken to the motion. Ms. Causey spoken to the motion. We've had questions asked. And so um, um, Ms. Gover, um, may we have a roll call vote, please, on the motion on the floor? It's been so long. Can I hear the motion? Again, please. Yes, Ms. Causey, could you repeat your motion, please? Certainly. I move to restore project line items 17 and 18, replacement Delaney and Towson High Schools from the fiscal year 2022 state capital budget request as line items 17 and 18 to the fiscal year 2022 county capital request with the specifications. Okay. Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote? Ms. Brown? Yes. Ms. Cosby? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? I'm very sorry, no. Ms. Joe? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? I'm sorry. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? I'm sorry. I abstain. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Abstain. 
Seven in favor. I'm sorry. Um, Ms. Um, Ms. Rowe, we can't quite hear you. Did the student member vote on that? I don't, I don't believe the student members are right. able to vote. Okay. Student members not eligible to vote on those items, ma'am. Okay, I'm not sure that. Could you review the count? Seven in favor, two opposed, two abstained. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gover. Okay, and um, uh, Dr. Hager had a question. Yes, thank you. Um, I have two questions. Um, one has to do with Lansdowne being um, eighth on the list as a priority, and then the comment that it may not be until September of 2030 when they would open. Um, given that they've already started with their uh, with the funding moving towards design and planning, are they then prioritized eighth? So will the other seven schools be built before them, or is it just um, you know, it, it, are the, is the listing um, somewhat arbitrary in that they will uh, all be built at some point? So I want to understand the question right. All of the projects ahead of Lansdowne in that spreadsheet, they are all ranked in order. So priority one will be funded first, second later, and on and on. But Lansdowne will, will be the first project among high schools. So there will be seven schools built before Lansdowne, even though Lansdowne's process has already begun because there are because the other seven schools ranked higher based the, on the consultant. The other seven schools have already been designed. I want to make sure we are talking about the same thing. When we when you talk about seven schools, you're talking about the priority on the spreadsheet that is in front of you. Yep. Yep. So all of those schools have been designed. They are waiting for state funding. And OK, state so similar, funding. similar to Lansdowne then. That's right. So they have to be funded first and then the term for Lansdowne comes later on. OK, it was a bit concerned and I was looking back at the um, the Canon uh, metrics that went into to kind of how these things were calculated because it's so heavy on elementary schools um, at the top. And so do you have any um, any idea if their formulas do give preference to elementary schools or is it does this happen that most of the schools at the top priority are elementary schools? OK, all of the elementary schools that you see, they are before Canon's involvement. So Canon were hired to develop high school plan first as part of phase one. And this is before your time, before you came to the board and the second part of their program will be to, to study remaining elementary schools and middle schools. So how it started that the discussion on high school have always been very passionate before in, and, and 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 condition of high schools need improvement. There are eight high schools that are in poor condition, according to Ken. The unfortunate part is that funding stream is limited. So instead of us deciding which school goes first, which school gets uh, renovated, which schools get constructed in high school and other schools, uh, board advocated for an independent study. So this is the board's study. They said up to Lansdowne is fine, but priority of high schools after that will be part of this Canon's study. So now Canon is recommending that let's do, when you look at the capacity, it's a combination of capacity, facility condition, and educational adequacy. When you look at all these three factors, then which schools are rated high? And the, the schools that are included in here, um, which is Towson and Dundalk Edition, they are rated high in their study. And what they are saying is the Sparrows Point, which is the top rated really, but we need to go deeper into it to find out where to build. For these two schools, you don't have to find a site. It's already there. Okay. Thank you for that explanation. I appreciate it. Okay. Ms. Jones, or excuse me, Ms. Scott, I have a question. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Uh, excuse me. Um, is that Ms. Uh, Mr. McMillian? Yes, please. Yes. Mr. Dixon, one quick question. Now that Delaney and Towson are back in the mix, 
who's going to determine where they fall in this list? Well, the funding is provided by county. So, and county is the one that have hired Canon Design. So board can add for their consideration, but in the end, those who write the check decide the priority. Thank, Thank you. you for that. Um, and I just had a brief question, um, Mr. Dixit. Um, we've heard a lot about the schools in the Northeast, um, schools also in the Southeast, Ian. I wanted to hear a little bit um, as far as schools in the Northwest, um, where they fall and, and how that, how those schools um, in the Northwest work into the, um, into everything. Thank you. Okay, so uh, that's a very good question, Madam Chair. And the good news is that most of the high schools on the west side are relatively better when you look at it from the capacity utilization, physical condition, and educational adequacy. They are relatively better because in the top eight, and I'll read it to you, Sparrows Point, Towson, Lansdowne, Dundalk, Catonsville, Catonsville is there on the west side, Delaney, Perry Hall, Eastern Tech. These are the in the worst condition. They are ranked lowest or highest in terms of poor condition. So after that comes Oinks Mills and, and, and on and on Western Technical. So Milford Mill has already gone through renovation once, so that's in a better condition. Franklin is in a better condition. So the, the picture on high school side is uh, on, on for high school is that on the western western side relatively they are better when we when you go to second phase uh, the situation might be different because we have built a lot of new schools on the eastern side this got great thank you very much for that oh yes uh, miss pastor okay um normally i don't try to explain my votes unless I have some uh, solid comments to make, but I'm, I'm going to say very quickly, I'm glad Ms. Scott just asked that question, uh, and I'm glad I got to hear your answer. I feel particularly for Towson. That's just, I mean, they're just squeezed in a little spot. I would like for something to be done for them now. I know that they want a new building, but they, they need some um, support immediately. But I also feel for what Mr. McMillian is saying. But when you say that, um, and this is this is not an attack on you, Mr. Dixon, because you know I love you. But when you say the schools on the west side are in better shape, every single time we do capital improvement, something is being patched, particularly at Randallstown. I lived Randall's town for 10 years and every single year something was being patched and patched and patched. We had to move out and sit at Deer Park while big things were being patched. So it and 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 when I was on that equity committee speaking to the inequity about when does it become a significant problem for a school so that we stop just patching and we did ask for this study and the people gave what they thought made sense to them or what their what metric they used to come up with their order and so we can't just throw uh the baby out with the water because the baby didn't get as clean as we thought it should it is this is the report and I'm having some feeling, I understand everybody's feelings about this because I have, like Ms. Scott brought up, I have some feelings about nothing being said about all of the years these schools, particularly Randallstown, have been patched and patched and patched and no one cares. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for that, Ms. Pastor. And thank you, um, Mr. Dixit, for your updates and, um, and everything. So. Thank you. OK, so and um, I would like to say that um, so this we'll hear more about this. Um, so thank you members for robust discussion and everything. Um, the 
I need to go back though because the next item on the agenda it was changed and um, so we'll have to go back a little bit because I went forward to the work session, but the next item is the discussion on the reopening of schools. And for that I. Call on Dr Williams. So thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, Scott, um, I think we have just a brief presentation. Mr. Corns. Yes, thank you. Uh, so thank you. Um, this was added tonight, um, but um, we wanted to provide some updates uh, to the board. So this is an update to the last presentation on December 22nd on uh, board meeting. Uh, we know that as we continue to prepare and monitor the metrics and continue in this recovery phase uh, of the cyber attack, um, we will be updating the full board at future meetings. Uh, this again is a brief presentation. Next slide, please. Have you seen this, uh, this slide before? Uh, it's really just emphasizing the uh, approach to a phase in of groups of students. Um, and this again was presented at previous uh, presentations to the board. Next slide, please. As a follow up uh, to the last board meeting, um, this slide uh, is representing some of the data uh, based on some questions uh, that were raised. Uh, so based on the questionnaire, the number of families indicated their students in phase one would return to in-person instruction in a hybrid setting is uh, 90 out of 154 responded, which is about 58% of respondents. The total enrollment for phase one, uh, the, is actually 372, so 41% of the families completed the questionnaire. Um, based on the questionnaire, the number of families indicating their students in phase two uh, would return to in-person instruction in a hybrid setting is 5,803 out of 9,539 responses, so that's about a 61% respondents. Uh, for for phase two, there are approximately 26,672 students. The total number of students enrolled in phase three, as you can see, uh, grades three to 12 in selected CTE is 2,407. However, the next one, the total number of students enrolled in phase four is 84,837. Uh, phase three and four uh, are combined, so that gives a total of 87,244 students. Um, and so we are in the process um, of doing our questionnaire. So the phase three and phase four questionnaire administration window will be open January 7th through January 14th. Also as a follow up, I believe Mr. Mahanza request about the extracurricular activities, uh, what we call EDA's extra duty assignments for student groups and activities. Uh, there are currently 1,951 1, EDAs related directly to student groups, clubs, or extracurricular activities. Um, elementary schools, there's approximately 639 middle schools 473 high school, 829 and public separate day schools. There are 10. Next slide, please. I wanted to put forth this slide regarding our health metrics. So using the guidance from Maryland State Department of Education and the Maryland Department of Health, uh, we monitor the Baltimore County positivity rate, the Baltimore County cases per 100,000 and the percent change in new cases per 100,000 and the cumulative cases per 100,000. All as outlined in our safety is our true north document. So as you can see from this slide as of January 1st, 
The Baltimore County positivity rate was at a 6.21%, clearly over 5%, and the Baltimore County cases per 100,000 was at 32.86, clearly over 15 cases. Next slide, please. As we prepare, uh, we look at several areas in terms of the facilities. All facilities have been clean and sanitized. Ongoing cleaning and sanit sanitization occurs as needed. Uh, the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning or HVAC systems are operating as designed. Uh, temperatures are set back at night and on weekends for energy conservation. All water outlets in all schools are currently being flushed on a regular basis and all ventilation equipment has been inspected uh, to verify the equipment is functioning as designed. If any repairs, modifications and adjustments are needed, that will happen prior to the return of staff and students. Uh, so tonight, I think that might be the last slide. Uh, so tonight, uh, we have members of the design team and members of our COVID-19 task force for any additional follow up. Um, as stated, uh, we're happy to return to the board on an ongoing basis to provide additional information regarding one, our COVID-19 metrics, uh, two, any updated information on our reopening plan, and more importantly, any updates regarding our recovery phase related to instruction and what's happening in buildings based on the ransomware attack. So tonight we have Dr. Mary Boswell McComas, our Chief Academic Officer, Ms. Christina Byers, our Community Superintendent Central Zone, Dr. Raquel Jones, Community Superintendent West Zone, Dr. George Roberts, Community Superintendent East Zone, Dr. Brian Scriven, our Chief Administrative and Operations Officer, and Dr. Michael Zarchin, Chief of School Climate and Safety, in addition to other staff members, such as uh, Ms. April Lewis, Dr. Mario Nuevez, uh, I believe Dr. Ms. Barbara Bernard and Ms. Debbie Somerville are present to capture any next steps or to respond to any questions at this time. So at this time, I'll turn it back over to Chairwoman Scott. Thank you for that, Dr. Williams. And we have a question from Ms. Lisa Mack. Good evening, Dr. Williams. Um, I think this might be a question for um, Ms. Somerville, but I'll just put it out there. Um, the governor recently announced that teachers are in group 1B, um, which could put them in line to get the vaccine by, by the end of the month, or at least the rollout to be by the end of the month. Have you worked at all with the Baltimore County Health Department to prioritize um, the availability of vaccines for Baltimore County staff? Um, I will start the response, and I don't know if Ms. Somerville or Dr. Zarchin uh, want to add to it, but um, just to remind the board, uh, I meet weekly with Dr. Branch, and again, the priority, as you said, one aid would be the emergency personnel, healthcare personnel. Um, there's questions about how, how much of the vac vaccines would be available, but to that point, we have, we have started the conversations about um, it, staff being on the list, the priority list, um, how would we go about looking at the priority of staff? And it goes back to the discussion that we had in December about the phase in and which phases would begin which then would require what we will then look at the number of of staff. Um, I think we need clarity and maybe Miss Somerville, Dr. Zarchin, um, when they say teachers, um, we want to make sure that may be inclusive of all, all those adults who would be working with with our students. So Miss if, if I said teachers, I thought I thought I said any staff. So if I said teachers, I meant any staff. And I, I, I would hope that our school nurses would be included in our plans to vaccinate our employees um, because I'm sure they have that ability to do so. Yes, the logistics and the next steps would, would be a, a, a ongoing conversation, but I don't know at this time if Ms. Somerville wants to add anything at this time. 
Thank you, Dr. Williams. I'd be happy to add. Um, we have over 40 of our school nurses participating in the um, Baltimore County Health Department vaccinations right now. So our school nurses are actively involved in the vaccination process. Um, I've had daily conversations with health over uh, the vaccination rollout plan. And um, so we're working on details about process and logistics. We're not at a phase at a point that I can report anything, but absolutely we are in conversations about you know how how this will roll out. I think there's a lot of factors that need to be worked out before I could give an answer about what the process and logistics will be. Thank you, Dr. Williams and Ms. Somerville um, for the information that you provided. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Uh, next, we have Dr. Hager. Hi, thank you. Um, I have a lot of questions, so I'll try to keep it to my two minutes. Um, I one is a, a recommendation, and that would be I, I know we have a, a, a nice uh, detailed plan that's um, in PDF form, and I love the dashboard. I think that was very well done. So thank you for that. Um, I I think it would be really great if uh, folks out there could hear what will happen when we hit that metric. And you don't need to do it tonight. Perhaps it would be for the next meeting. But once we really hit those numbers that we are targeting you know, what is the next exact step? So do we need to find out exactly which kids are coming into the building and how they're going to get there? And kind of all those details that are giving, I think giving a lot of people anxiety, knowing that we might actually have an opportunity to get back into buildings. And so it's just a request to potentially provide that really detailed planning information to the board and to the public uh, sooner rather than later. So I don't know if you want to respond to that or- Sure. Or Sure, you know, we've had the plans, but like to anything, it's, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have my camera. It's actually implementing the plan. And 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 so we'll be happy to um, follow up. For us, we have a different additional layer. And the additional layer is our recovery phase regarding the ransomware and cyber attacks. So to your point, um, we're happy to kind of describe what that would look like, kind of like let ready, set, go and what that may look like. Um, so so yes, and I can actually follow up with you, Dr. Hager, about some of the additional questions that you have if we don't get to them tonight. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and I, I feel like one of the biggest um, barriers that we've discussed in the past is just making sure there's enough buy-in from all of our community, from our teachers and our staff to really get back into buildings. And so have we made progress with ensuring that everybody's on board with all the safety measures that are in place and everything like that? So do we have an official signature, I guess, to get back into buildings? Working with the staff, Ask that question one more time. Let me make sure no, I understand. That, just um, the buy-in from the teachers and the staff to to, to get back in. Are, are, um, are all of our folks that are in our broader community on board with coming back into buildings and have they um, agreed through a formal MOU or some sort of an agreement to, to come back when we're ready? Uh, so our point of reference is George Duke, who was working with our unions with the MOUs. Um, and so there, there's still questions about the metrics um, at this point. So, uh, and there's some other things about um, logistics. Um, and so we, we're still having those conversations. Okay, no, thank I appreciate that. And then lastly, ha has there been a decision about whether um, if, we're, if we do a hybrid model, whether the teachers all have to come back into buildings or can some, um, can some opt to continue to teach online given that children won't be vaccinated? We know that they won't be vaccinated. They haven't been approved to be vaccinated. So I imagine there will still be some children who will be staying at home even if we reopen. Well, I think this, this discussion about um, educators being on the 1B may help. Um, mm -hmm. And so since that was recently shared, um, we'll circle back and see. I, I will say um, in terms of planning, as 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 many of the folks who are on the design team um, have been former principals, as well as we have our principals, teachers, other stakeholders provide feedback. Um, what's that saying? It will take a village um, to do what we're trying to do with hybrid. So uh, we, we we still want to work through those finer details with with all of that. But I think just hearing that about the educators being on the list may may lessen some of that anxiety but um again that that was just a recent message so we, we have to work through that announcement 
Yeah, no, I'm so excited about that news. It's wonderful news. So I'll end there, but thank you very much for your answers. I appreciate it. Yep, thank you. Thank you. And next we have Mr. Mahumza. Yes, thank you. Um, Dr. Williams, my question was about um, uh, the extracurricular activities uh, or EDAs, I believe that's what you said. Um, I appreciate you providing the numbers. Uh, my initial, when I initially uh, requested that information, I was I wanted like uh, a breakdown of each individual school and the activities they uh, each school provided. Was was that is that was that request feasible for you and your staff? So we have the total number, the aggregate. Um, if you give us some time, we can provide that um, data. Let me just check in with the community superintendent. Is that accurate? That, that, we that, that is that is correct, yes. Dr. Okay, Williams. All right, thank yes. you. Mr. Mahamza. Yes, yeah, we'll, we'll be happy to follow up, Mr. Mahamza, on that. Okay, then, um, yeah, because uh, I want to, I really want to see um, each individual school's idea. I, I appreciate that we have these many activities going on, but I would like to see what's happening on each individual school level. But thanks again, Dr. Williams. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Next, we have Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, Dr. Williams. Um, and as much as you can speak to it, and I, I understand there are details you can't share, um, could you share with us the impact of the ransomware attack on the reentry re plan and what um, critical systems need to be recovered in order to move us forward? So, um... I am not at this time to able to speak to all of the specifics um, as we just return um, and the team, our members are still working on the uh, recovery. Uh, we, we, we do know that um, our internet um, at the schools are limited if not functioning, um, but um, I think when we come back on the 19th, if that's the next board meeting, I, I may be able to provide a much more thorough update on that because I know we have been working and we, the Department of IT and other staff members uh, and our partners in Baltimore County have been great, but we've been working on um, trying to restore what we have and, and, and looking at backups. But um, I, I think as we get close to the very end of all the work that's happening regarding um, what happened with the ransomware cyber attack and as we bring some um, closure or some next steps with that, we'll be happy to be very specific um, because that's why I, I, I stated that as we looked at the reentry plan as I was responding to Dr. Hager, we have a third component that we have to deal with, which is the ransomware cyber attack and how that may hinder some of our next steps. Sure, and I think when we think about the impact of it, at least when I do, I think about our virtual learning environment, but as I talk to teachers, their concerns about reentry um, have to do with the, the physical um, school environment and they, they bring up things um, such as security, such as systems that you wouldn't necessarily think of as being critical to the reentry. So um, I think the board would be interested and, and would have a greater appreciation of all of the, the boxes we still have to check in order to, to make this happen and, and fully understand the, the real impact. Because as you said, it was catastrophic. And I think it would be helpful to understand what that looks like in terms of the, the physical environment um, of our facilities and things we, we may not have considered. You mentioned internet, but are there other things we should be um, considering and that we need to be updated on. Absolutely, and that's why I said that's that's exactly. another. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. That's I'm another. Sorry. That's another layer that we have to look at as we uh, look at re-entering. So, is that re uh, responding and trying to the recovery phase of the ransomware cyber attack? So, thank you. Sure. So there is some somewhere or someone is assigned to looking at um, these are systems that are critical to to reopen versus I guess in terms of criticality 
um, we need these to open the doors. These would be nice to have, you know, in terms of levels of priority. And right. our IT teams looking so at remember, that. So remember the priority, there were two priorities. The priorities were operational, you know, how do we continue to operate, as well as trying to bring students and staff together. And so the internal teams um, are looking at all of the different aspects. Um, and again, this just adds another layer as we're talking about reentry plan. So, you know, it is my hope by the 19th we can give a little bit more specificity around this um, as much as we can and as where we are with all of this in terms of the, the reentry. You know, again, this back in November that really impacted us as a system. And so we're just looking at how best to recover uh, and what we what we can do added to this whole reentry plan. So it's it's a lot of work and I, I really have to thank the teams for really working hard and our school base staff have been very instrumental in providing feedback and working with us. So I understand your question. OK, thank you. And and to Dr. Hager's point, I think the the more detailed um, information we can provide because again a lot of this is I'll just finish my, my comment. Is, okay. is the, the, and the ransomware has added okay. to that exponentially. So I would, um, I just want to agree with Dr. Hager's comments about the need to. I, I'm sorry, Ms. Ken, we do have to keep on. It's, it's late and other members would like to speak. So I do want to um, make sure that we're respectful of everyone's time. Just um, because we have Ms. Rowe who wanted to speak next. So I don't want to. In, encroach on her time. Ms. Rowe. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Williams, um, just to sum up what I think you just said, are you saying that even if the metrics were perfect today and even if we had a reopening plan, that the ransomware attack and the effects that had would present an obstacle to immediately beginning to reopen? I'm saying that the ransomware attack has impacted us in terms of, uh, as you recall, where we had to close schools. So as we are looking at the recovery phase, um, I have to be realistic as we're looking at our plan, um, just really building what Ms. Hen is saying, we have to look at all the other components by bringing students and staff in a hybrid model Will we, will we be able to do that so folks have access to what they need in the school building? And so I, I'm simply saying that's another factor that we have to take in place and as we look at the reentry plan. Okay, and my other question is, have we done any work as far as reopening, pricing out the PPE that would be necessary to reopen? I'm aware that one school system that's slightly smaller than we are spent $12 million just on masks alone. And once we price out all the PPE and extra cleaning and other safety things that we need, um, what funding sources are available to fund those things since they're not in our current budget? And also as that pertains to buses, et cetera, I guess I'm looking for <laughs> cost implications of reopening or hybrid, et cetera. So thank you for that. I'll start and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Scriven. So as you well know, we received CARES Act uh, uh, funds to support us. And in addition, the county executive gave us, gave each school an allocation um, specifically around the PPEs <laughs> Uh, hand sanitizers and other equipment. Um, and so um, we have, as I shared earlier in the year, uh, we have been stocking up on our, our PPEs, but I just want to see if, if Dr. Scriven can add any additional information um, to that. Um, and we can we can always circle back with some specifics as we're coming back at the next board meeting and subsequent meetings to provide updates. But Dr. Scriven, anything? 
Uh, yes, sir. So, uh, Ms. Rowe, I will put together uh, an update uh, where we itemize the number of uh, PPE items we were able to purchase uh, for each school. Uh, principals really took the lead in terms of identifying uh, what they felt was needed with respect to PPE, uh, but uh, county government was extremely generous uh, with those uh, with those items where we we potentially may have even exceeded the 11.5 million. Uh, that was allocated. So um, we have a detailed report. Those items actually will start to come in the end of this month. Uh, so we can provide uh, a weekly update for you and also give you the timeline with moving forward. And not just for you, but of course for the whole board. Okay, thank you. That's all the questions I have. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Uh, next, we have Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, Mr. Wo or Dr. Williams, thank you for the information you provided. I appreciate it. I know this is not an easy situation. Um, I want to start with managing some expectations and understanding what we're going to do. Uh, so if the positivity rate drops significantly to under 5% and the metrics are in line on say a Thursday, uh, when do you expect to open schools after that? When, when would um, uh, teachers and staff be required to be back in the schools and then students be available and, and in, back in the schools? So, um there's an additional area that again looking at the recovery phase uh, so um, right now in, in depth somerville or dr zarchin can can add on to this um, if all looks well at whatever point it is then notifying um, and getting our teachers and staff to prepare now for the hybrid, meaning they would then have to have access to the facilities, um, the schedules as, as we're dealing with the questionnaire. Um, so there's, there's, there's leg work that needs to take place before. So developing the schedules, who, who's coming in, who's a part of cohort A or B, who's gonna just stay virtual um, and so I, I, right now I'm, I'm hesitant in giving a date or time frame because of the logistics. Um, we do know that our original plan was to begin for second semester for a hybrid, but because of the circumstances we're in and because of the metrics, um, uh, we, we're constantly watching. And again, the, 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 our, our health folks are always advising about the phase in. So unfortunately, I, I can't narrow it down, um, but we, we, we are targeting a second semester, but because of our circumstances and what it looks like as a county, I don't know if that is doable, but Deb Somerville or Dr. Zarch, anything you wanna add? Yes, I, I can certainly add based on my conversations with Dr. Branch and I'll let uh, Deb Somerville chime in as well. What uh, what we have been asked to do is to watch and wait for two consistent weeks of the score being under that five and 15 um, that the Maryland State Department of Education and Department of Health have recommended. Now what we could do after the first week when there's an indication that this is going to be a continue to drop is let teachers know that they need to be prepared to return after that second week as long as the scores continue to trend in the right direction. Um, in the research that's been coming out most recently, the one piece that, that continues to service about the spread in schools is that it is not as great 
when the numbers are lower in the community. When the numbers are high and hospitalization is higher, that's when we're seeing or when the researchers are seeing spread in schools. So making sure that that number drops uh, below the guidelines provided by MSDE and MDH are going to be very important. And I'll let Deb uh, sound in as well. Ms. Somerville. Thank you, Dr. Zarchin. I don't have too much to add. I can say that the, the numbers aren't going to just arrive at 15 overnight. It's going to be a trend that we will be able to see based on, um, you know, it, it, the, the numbers show really clear trends. And I think that we will be able to predict that we're approaching them and be really in a planning mode rather in, than in a reacting mode. So that as Dr. Zarchin described, we might be announcing after one week, you know, ready, set, go, it's gonna happen soon. So I, don't, I certainly am not in a position to say the time, but I can say if you look at the trends, if you look at the graphs, there's, um, there's there's bubbles, but we don't. We're not going to react to bubbles. We're going to be going looking at um, consistent trends that really reflect the true nature of the disease in our community. Okay, thank you. I I understand that this isn't going to magically snap, and 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 we're going to be changing and moving forward immediately. But that's why I asked the question so that everybody understands that we have to have trending and the right numbers in order to move forward. The other question I have, and, and this is where I think it might get a, more, a bit more complicated. Um, if staff is vaccinated, if they have the option to be vaccinated, and um, are we going to then open regardless of the metrics if everyone has um, been vaccinated, all the, all the staff? Well, um, Good question, can't answer that. We do know all the staff in terms of Baltimore County Public Schools, all the staff, uh, I'm questioning if that's going to be the case, just knowing um, that we are, I, I believe uh, Ms. Matt said 1B and we're not the healthcare providers. Um, and so those are the logistics that Ms. Somerville and Dr. Zarchin are, are speaking to um because even with the va vaccine if the metrics still present the cases that's our convers these high numbers the five percent and over 15 that's the conversation with the health department in Deb Somerville that will guide us in what we can do with that so I appreciate that question we we at this point can't answer that at this time okay I think that this is a conversation that Ms. Somerville and Dr. Zarkin need to to address because that's a situation we may be in um, relatively soon. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, that sounds like the time. And also, Wharton, you, uh, you can always email questions, and this is obviously an ongoing conversation. It's, so um, next we have Ms. Causey. Hello. <laughs> Good evening. Um, thank you very much for questions and answers so far, Dr. Williams. Um, a quick question for Dr. Somerville. When you mentioned it's 60 nurses that are helping the county um, health department provide vaccines, uh, those nurses have already received their own. Is that the case? So it's my understanding, yes, ma'am, that the um, that the county health department offered vaccines to the vaccinators. Wonderful. The other thing that I wanted to speak to is, um, number one, it's very encouraging uh, that the teachers in Group 1B, and as we know, vaccines are getting approved and rolled out, um, so we can anticipate an exponential recovery um, so that as you're planning, um, unlike these surges that we've had of infection, we'll know that there's a countermeasure with the vaccines. Um, <clears throat> the um, Dr. Williams, at the last board meeting, we had um, asked you to have a conversation with Dr. Branch about um, the phased in approach. Um, and I know that we had the holidays, so if you didn't have time, that's okay. But did you have uh, the opportunity to do that? And also, does MSDE also need to approve the reopening plan? 
So uh, Dr. Branch and I have had conversations. Thank you for re just reiterating. Um, I did have a small winter break, so I chose not to follow up with too many people because um, I think we all needed a little bit of a break. Um, again, just this Monday, he and I have had a conversation and we may be able to provide some updates um, re regarding that. Um, he again, his team and our team have really worked well together. Great, thank you. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge uh, the hundreds of emails that we have been receiving from parents, teachers, and students in supporting uh, reopening uh, because of the impact that the uh, pandemic and the remote learning has had on our students. Um, have all of those emails that come into the board, are all of those being sent into the reopening and design teams email? So I can ask someone from the design team, is my understanding those emails are being forwarded um, to yeah. the design team? Um, but anybody from the design team want to give any clarifying information at this time? There's been a lot of emails and 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 we saw a little bit of a slowdown process because of the cyber attack, um, but um, I would I would just ask anybody from the design team that would like to give any additional information about emails. So Dr. Williams, yes, we do. And Ms. Causey, yes, we do. We receive um, on a daily basis an update um, and with the actual emails that come through the board or to the reopening website. And we have access to the link as well as um, emails that are sent to the Board of Education or shared with us as well. Fantastic, because there's some of the emails are heartbreaking with the impacts on our students, especially a teacher sent a survey that she had done with um, some of her students, uh, many of them with um, special needs uh, and just the um, the losses that uh, they're suffering during this pandemic uh, process. Uh, but also many of them are very encouraging in that the community is asking how they can help. So my next um, bit of questions relates to resources. So um, a report on the grant funding would be helpful with the actual dollar amounts spent and yet remaining. Um, and okay, it's time yes. um, and you can always email your questions over. Yes, and I just wanted to acknowledge that there were a lot of uh, okay. supports offered from the county and just to see how we as a community can come together okay. and really apply all the resources. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Okay, next we have uh, Mr. McMillian. Hey, great. Uh, I've talked about this before. The students that love virtual learning and want to stay on virtual learning for whatever reasons, a, a merit of reasons. Uh, as you design the hybrid plan, are these young people going to have the opportunity to stay in a hybrid setting if they've been productive and them and their parents want them to remain in a in a in a virtual setting in their own home thank you so just a reminder you know the questionnaire helps with that to say what what are the desires of the family um, to be a part of the hybrid model or to stay virtual um, so that's a part of the work that we want to find out so we can plan. But any additional information from the design team? Uh, good evening. Thank you, Dr. Williams. I will just add um, for Mr. McMillian, um, as Dr. Williams indicated, yes, while we are in hybrid, students and families would have the option to maintain a virtual option. Once we return to normal full in-person uh, school, uh, that virtual option would go away. However, as you know from being a member of our curriculum committee, we do offer e-learning programs uh, for students at the secondary level. Um, if you recall, we did a presentation just a little over a year ago um, that talked about where we are in those opportunities for students. So thank you. OK, Dr. McComas, if I'm not mistaken, with the e-learning, a lot of those classes have not been certified by the State Department of Education toward graduation requirements. Is that correct? No, that's an accurate understanding, Mr. McMillian. What we do not have is 
a complete set of courses for a student to do all of high school. So there are some high school credits that a student must do in a brick and mortar setting. Uh, we do, however, offer a quite an extensive uh, menu of um, requirements that students can complete in the e-learning program. However, it's just not the complete uh, menu required for a state diploma, but we continue to expand and work through that um, as we shared last year. Um, last year, I specifically remember talking to you because we were piloting the uh, physical education uh, program that way. So we'll continue to provide you updates in the curriculum committee as as that program expands. But I, I understand clearly your vision, Mr. McMillian, and I appreciate uh, your persistence in the conversation. So thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. And are all of our e-learning classes right now certified by the state? I'm not clear what you mean, sir, by certified by the state, but all of our e-learning programs are um, authorized courses and have master course files that have been registered with the state. OK, when I say certified, I mean certified toward graduation requirement. So if some kid goes on e-learning and takes six credits, are all of those classes then can they be applied for graduation requirements? They all are count towards the transcript. And if it is a graduation required class that is part of the e-learning program, yes. But again, the e-learning program does not offer every single graduation requirement. Um, and I'm happy to follow up in a curriculum committee, Mr. McMillian. I, I know this is a passion of yours, so I, I just didn't want to take up the entire reopening plan on that, um, but I'm happy to do more follow up. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have um, Miss Lily Rowe. Thank you, Madam Chair. I I really wanted to, I was actually going to bring up what Mr. McMillian brought up, that as we are considering reopening, one of the things that having to do schooling virtual has taught us is that things that the board has been informed are not possible or that the school system doesn't have the capacity to do that they are possible so one of the things i would like our school system to look at as we're reopening is home and hospital should look like virtual learning it shouldn't be just six hours of instruction a week it should look like this e-learning should look like this and i see no reason why we can't have a virtual homeschooling option for parents who want to homeschool so that we're not losing federal and state funding to homeschoolers so those are things that I think that we should consider as offerings in our school system. And I hope that as we reopen that we are um, looking at those things. Thank you. Thank you. It's the time. And um, last we have, uh, looks like Ms. Mack. Um, thank you, um, Ms. Scott. I just want, Mr. McMillian and I have discussed um, his question and I fully support <laughs> looking into that. And I just wanted to say, I appreciate Dr. McComas, you um, agreeing to discuss this further um, in curriculum and instruction, but I would encourage the system to look at it as a solution, uh, kind of what Ms. Rowe was saying as far as home and hospital, to, to not bring kids back to school and then come up with a plan, but look at a way as we are looking at bringing kids back of making the um, e-learning um, more robust and allowing more students to stay in it. Um, I think it would help with school overcrowding. It helps with bullying. It helps with student um, morale for students who want to work from home, who do well. I'd like it to be more formalized, I guess is what I'm saying, that we, we look at it in a formal manner and have a readout on it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Excuse um, me. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Mack. <laughs> Ms. Madam Chairperson Scott, if I just respond, sure. the whole concept about e-learning and what Dr. McComas was saying, um, for it to then replace what we currently have would be some work that we would have to do with the State Department of Education. Um, it is it requires uh, approval or next steps and it will require some work. Um, I do know 
um, across the country. There's been some other districts looking at that, <coughs> but because of our configuration, and Dr. McComas can correct me if I'm if I'm going down a path that uh, she needs to correct me. Um, but that does require State Department of Education, and that does require work um, and approval. The um, the e-learning are courses, but what I hear is uh, e-learning or virtual learning to replace the option of coming into a building. Um, that has been discussed in my meetings um, with the state superintendent, um, and I just know at this point that's going to require some work. We're not afraid of the work, um, but I want, I, it, I'm basically saying it just can't happen overnight because there's going to have to be some approval, just like the e-learning courses had to have some approval. Um, but I, I, th you mentioned this several times and even hearing from the kids that this seems to be working from some students. Um, it's just re it's going to require us some work to, to even consider that, but definitely we have to work with the State Department. Dr. McComas, was I on point with that or, or was that something I need to, we need to follow up later? No, sir, you, you were absolutely correct. As, as you shared, the state is exploring that. Um, there is not uh, currently, you know, we don't have a 100% a replacement uh, option for students at the high school level for graduation requirements. And so you were on point. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that. OK, and the next item on the agenda is an update on in person graduations. And for that, again, we would call on Dr. Williams. Well, since I've been talking for the last several minutes, I'm a pivot and I'm going to ask Dr. Michael Sarchin or Dr. Amalio Nuevez to just provide an update at this time about um, in-person graduation. Thank you, Dr. Williams. So Kim Ferguson is our lead on uh, graduations, but Dr. Nieves is very involved. So I'm going to ask that Dr. Nieves give an overview for, for you now. Thank you, Dr. Zarchin. Good evening, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, Dr. Williams and members of the board. Um, as Dr. Williams mentioned earlier this evening, COVID-19 uh, has impacted all of our operations and graduation is notwithstanding. Um, with the unknown of the continuous impact of COVID-19, uh, Ms. Ferguson began to convene meetings with stakeholder groups. So we had a meeting with school leaders, with our graduation coordinators, with our students and with our caregivers, our parents and caregivers um, to discuss alternative strategies and brainstorm options and venues for conducting in-person graduation ceremonies. At this point, our traditional venues, Towson University and the University of Maryland of Baltimore County have not made decisions regarding the availability of their venues um, uh, uh, for, for, our, uh, for hosting our graduation ceremonies. Uh, what we did hear uh, as recently as this morning is that Towson University hopes to have a decision for us by the end of January as to whether they will be able to uh, host us for in-person ceremonies. Uh, the graduation dates for 2021 have been approved by cabinet and uh, we will be communicating those dates to all stakeholders um, in the next week or so. Uh, what Ms. Ferguson will be doing um, as a follow up to some of the discussions around the graduation ceremonies and um, awaiting a decision from our two venues is uh, we're going to start convening some stakeholder meetings to discuss um, and finalize some uh, venues and logistics for the ceremonies should Towson um, University and UMBC not be available 
and we want to be able to have a firm plan in place no later than the end of February. That way we can provide sufficient notice to um, all our stakeholders and we can begin uh, preparations for our graduation ceremonies, which are scheduled to take place um, beginning May 18th and um, continuing till June 7th, 2021. Oh, thank you. Is that the end of the presentation? Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> OK. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Williams, are, is there any additional information? Um, well, not at this time. Um, uh, the um, added agenda was just a status report, and, and that's all we can provide at this time. So I appreciate um, the board's attention, and we'll be happy to uh, follow up in the near future with some updates. OK, thank you. And it looks like we have a question from Ms. Causey. Good evening and thank you very much for that update. We appreciate the work to really uh, try and accommodate um, as wonderful a graduation as we can for these students that have lost so much. Uh, my question relates to the timing that you just mentioned, May 18th to 6th to the 7th. I'm wondering if that's um, early given what happened last year uh, when we went into uh, virtual learning, but also related to the advanced placement tests. Do you have information or could you provide it related to the advanced placement testing window? So usually the advanced placement testing window is the beginning of the May. And so we, we try to work, we have worked around that. Um, as you all know, um, the assessment last spring because we were virtual, um, the assessment itself was changed. Um, once we get more information, we'll be happy to share that. What um, Dr. Nuevez was just describing was the graduation window, but at some point we're going to have to look at plan B or plan C and keep in mind we still would have to abide by the capacity and any other restrictions if we are able to proceed with a person in person graduation ceremony. So again, you know, uh, we can always follow up as we get new information regarding the specifics. So thank you for that question. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank, thank you, Dr. Williams, and thank you, Dr. Nieves, for this um, last minute update. I greatly appreciate it, as I know um, our community, community members do as well. Um, Dr. Nieves, I understood you to say we have backup sites. Um, should Towson not be able to accommodate us? Is that correct? We have some some suggestions that our stakeholder groups have have offered to us. Um, and as a matter of fact, in speaking to Ms. Ferguson earlier today, even as uh, er, as late as this evening, we've had uh, suggestions provided from members of the community. So we are compiling that information at this moment. And then it is our hope that when we convene this uh, next work group, that this uh, work group will uh, vet these suggestions and make some recommendations. Wonderful. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Head. And next we have Ms. Rowe. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just would like to know when we're discussing in person graduations, do those follow the same metrics as reopening school, or is that a different consideration? So, the question, it would be an event and it would fall with right now with the restrictions that we have with large groups. Um, and that's what we were looking at, if you recall, last spring. Um, and so at this point, because it's, it, it's an event, we would have to look at the restrictions that are put in place for large groups. Um, Dr. Nueves, anything you want to add to that? You're right, Dr. Williams. Um, the only thing that I would add is that we, when we ha held our first 
set of focus groups. Uh, we, the way we presented the information to the focus groups was that we would always take into consideration the metrics um, at the time that we were making um, decisions, but we knew that our plans would have to be fluid based on the metrics at any given moment. And so we would have to have various scenarios in place um, in case those metrics change, including uh, virtual options. Although we know that's not the preferred option, we wanted to make sure we have uh, all those options on the table and, uh, and very concrete plans in place so that uh, we can move swiftly. Okay, and has anyone considered Benji's drive-in as an option? Yes, that's been, that's one of the options that that has um, been offered and that is under consideration. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next, we have Mr. Mahomsa. Yes, uh, Dr. Williams, I, I just had a quick question about um, it has like the process of like end of the year celebrations. I, I understand that um, the uh, the school system, uh, specifically the central office, provides a lot of input for graduation. But uh, in terms of um, other senior celebrations like prom, uh, awards, senior awards, picnics, uh, those kinds of things, are, are those decisions made by individual schools or are, are those also going to be made by your team? So um... We had to make some decisions last year because of the metrics in this and the order about large groups. Uh, the actual events itself, as you will know, um, the location of prom and all those activities are school decisions. Um, I'm sure their guidance definitely when it comes to where uh, we've used events before or venues before. Uh, but again, those those senior activities may fall into a similar category as we had to experience, unfortunately, last year, where we had to um, limit, or we had to cancel those activities because of the metrics. So are those uh, also going to be um, discussed uh, with uh, this graduation, I, I think? We had to last year. I'm sure we'll have to do it this year as we okay. look at how to close out another school year. Okay, thank you. And uh, I don't know if this was mentioned, but I would I'd like to know, like, when should we expect a plan or an update? Um, is this going to be a couple months? Uh, is the decision going to be made a couple months before um, May, when usually these events occurs? And I know, like, prom sometimes it starts in like April. And so, are we going to have an update prior to? Dr. Nueva has gave an update um, regarding uh, graduation. Uh, let us um, follow up. I'm sure our principals are waiting. We try to, last year we tried to wait as, as late as possible mm -hmm. um, because we didn't really want to cancel, but we had to cancel. Um, and so, um, We'll just have to follow up with that, Mr. Mahamza. You know, looking at the time in which decisions will be made, um, and again for those senior activities, um, we try to end graduation. We try to wait as late as possible, hoping that there would be some opportunity. Um, so I, I can just say at this point, since it's just January, please stay tuned and 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 we'll work through as much as we can, but a lot of it is just the state where we are in terms of the, the pandemic um, around those dates that they usually have senior activities. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, thank you for much, so much for that. And um, as we move along, um, the next item on the agenda is the superintendent's proposed fiscal year 2022 up operating budget. And this budget is a presentation. Um, this budget presentation is a report and questions um, uh, will can be submitted. And for that, I call on Dr. Williams. Uh, 
Wow, so good evening, Madam uh, Chair Woman Scott, Vice Chair Hen, and members of the board. Um, I know it's been a long meeting. I appreciate this opportunity uh, to present my proposed FY 2022 budget tonight. Um, I will be able to go through just some highlights and then um, we will finalize by presenting the schedule and some um, next steps when it comes to the budget. So thank you. Uh, next slide, please. As you're aware, the pandemic has caused us to dr uh, dramatically alter our learning plans and ensure that there are personal connections with each student. We have seen the impact and will continue to work through these challenges. One area that has been impacted is a temporary uh, decrease in our elementary, elementary enrollment. Next slide. The COVID-19 pandemic led us to focus on the following areas, high quality teaching and learning, social emotion learning and community building, specifically teaching and learning aligned with the state and national standards, equity resources and additional supports, looking at identifying and mitigating barriers to engagement and significant improvements over the spring of school year 2019-20. Next slide. Since March 13th, our staff has worked to provide services to students, which included meals to every student who was in need and a device to every student. Food and Nutrition Services delivered 1.7 million meals to families in need from September through December 2020. 70 locations, 87 summer sites, and 300 community bus routes stood up to deliver food daily. 37,000 student devices were mailed pre-ransomware. 36,000 devices were distributed at the start of the school year, and 82,000 staff and student devices will be exchanged due to the ransomware attack. Next slide. Last June, recall, uh, I presented our new strategic plan, the Compass, our pathway to excellence. Next slide, please. The specific within the plan uh, was based on my 100 day entry plan and feedback and led to these five areas of focus. Learning accountability results, safe and supportive environment, high performing workforce and alignment of human capital, community engagement and partnerships, and operational excellence. Next slide. Although the strategic plan was completed for the 2020 summer and this current school year, the needs of our system continue to rise. The pandemic has stretched resources to the breaking point, especially with regards to our most vulnerable populations. Our financial resources also have been stretched. The county was only able to provide a maintenance of effort budget for FY21 this current school year. Next slide. So here you can see this mismatch between required resources and what was able to be funded by Baltimore County. $108 million and 418 FTEs in my FY 2021 request could not be funded by the county due to the financial outlook. We now have to look at what and how we are providing services due to this financial outlook. Next slide. Although we have seen a decline in our enrollment due to the pandemic, the needs of our students are increasing. We have a rapidly growing second language population and an increase of students eligible for free and reduced price meals. As of September 30th, our enrollment was 111,084 students with 53% of our students eligible for free and reduced price meals. Next slide. Our student population continues to be diverse and we celebrate that diversity. Please note the students we serve in 1986 versus the current school year. We are now educating a much more diverse population with 40.1% African American, 7.3% Asian, 11.9% Hispanic, 
5% multiracial and 0.1% Pacific Islander. There has been a significant demographic shift. Next slide. So back in 1990s, 1977, BCPS has been transformed from a predominantly white school system to one that demonstrates considerable diversity, no longer minority. In fact, beginning in F school year 2007, BCPS had more non-white students than white students. This graphic, as I shared last year, this graphic uh, explains why we need to do things differently. This change didn't happen overnight. We now have to look at what and how we are providing services due to our financial outlook. Next slide. This graph shows that high mobility persists, though it's reduced from 10 years ago. For example, one out of every five children is moving within the system. We saw a significant FY 2020 spike. We believe this may be tied to the pandemic. I believe that we have to continue our focus on our supports to schools and to lessen the variance from school to school or zone to zone. Next slide. We have seen a 44% increase in the number of students eligible for free and reduced price meals over the past decade. Our English language learners have grown close to 162% and the number of homeless children increased by 105% over the past 10 years. Next slide. So our farms rate took a steep jump this year related to the pandemic related economic disruptions. The rate was already extremely high, reflecting the deep needs of our students. So this is an aggregate report. As we look at individual schools based on the required federal calculations, we have an elementary school as high as 100% farms and another school as low as 3.3% farms. We actually have 14, 14 secondary schools with a farms rate at 70% or higher. Next slide. We still celebrate our 87.6 overall graduation rate for the class of 2019. The BCPS graduation rate exceeds the Maryland state average of 86.9%. So you may ask, why do we have the class of 2019 and not the class of 2020? Well, the class of 2020 data will be available from MSDE in the next few months. We have, based on this data, we still have work to do and will continue to ensure our students are college and career ready as defined by MSDE. Next slide. We still have work to do with increasing our graduation rates for Hispanic and African-American students and our multi-race students. And we have work to do for our students who are English language learners and those students receiving special education services. Next slide. We have seen that some students need more time to develop a positive trajectory and graduate. I believe this extra time help prepare our students to access college and career options and our staff will continue to support our students in post-secondary options. Next slide. Although our dropout rate for the class of 2019 was at about 8.8%, there's still more work to be done. We will analyze the root causes for certain student groups and strive to lessen these percentages. I believe targeting students as early as middle schools and developing a six year plan with access and opportunities to programs, activities and courses can help to decrease these dropout rates. Next slide. Several student populations requiring the most intensive support grew much faster than overall enrollment. These students uh, require greater support and specifically trained staff. Baltimore County Public Schools now serves significantly more students receiving special education services, including autism, a growth of 34%, development, developmentally delayed, 
increase of 38%, and those students with multiple disabilities, an increase of 53% than five years ago. We have worked with our special ed department to re-examine how we support our schools and provide the necessary resources to our students. Next slide. Our English language learners increased by 162% over the past decade. The decree decrease for the September 2020 is temporary, driven by the COVID related enrollment drop. Even with the enrollment decrease, we have seen an increase of English language learners over the past two years of 1,165 students. We will continue to provide the necessary resources and supports so our English language learners have equitable access to all specialized academic and non-academic programming. Next slide. Strong enrollment growth had continued through FY 2020. COVID-19 caused what we believe is a temporary drop of 3,954 students in FY 2021 based on the September 2020 enrollment data. Next slide. Enrollment declines hit our youngest learners. While we still saw some growth in secondary, in-person instruction is especially critical for our youngest and neediest learners and our reopening plan addresses the hybrid model when it's safe to have small groups of students to attend in person. Next slide. BCPS is in the process of revising its projected enrollment, taking into account the effects of COVID. Next slide. So student enrollment overall dropped, as I shared earlier, by 3,954, while those eligible for funding dropped by 2,991 versus the September 2019 data, having a potentially devastating impact on funding. Legally mandated revenue at the state and county levels are projected to be a $43 million below FY21. Without any hold harmless modifications to the state formula, revenue will drop $20 million. Given lower enrollment across the state, it is not clear if such funding will be available. So maintenance of effort, Baltimore County is required to provide the same funds per pupil as the prior year, based on the September 30th student count. In a year with declining enrollment, the MOE drops, in this case, by $23 million. However, my proposed budget assumes roughly flat state revenue to FY21 and county funding $16 million above the FY21 to support potential employee uh, compensation changes. So our budget, next slide, is really about the people. Salaries and benefits make up 83% of our budget. The budget contains a modest compensation increase for our hardworking staff to keep them competitive with surrounding jurisdictions. Although no new initiatives could be funded, the budget maintains instructional staffing ratios and materials, school per pupil budgets, facilities maintenance, technology infrastructure, and capital programs. Next slide. The budget responsibly identifies savings that are used to support increases in benefit and contractual inflation. The largest item is a drop in vacant teaching positions to match our reduced enrollment. Next slide. As already mentioned, our budget is all about the people. The budget contains the modest compensation increase to keep staff competitive, as well as fringe benefit increases. The budget also contains minimum wage increase, CEP expansion to 87 schools, special education, charter school increase to include fifth grade, and utility rate inflation. Next slide. So the summary. Next slide. 
The proposed general fund budget, which contains almost all of the day to day spending for schools and offices, include including most salaries, is proposed at $1.67 billion for FY22. The two largest segments are the county, the proposed budget, uh, represent funding of 16.3 million over FY21, or a 5.1% above maintenance of effort level. For the state, overall state general fund revenues are expected to drop slightly by $1.6 million. BCPS projecting that the state will hold harmless the state aid funding formula to offset the BCPS drop in enrollment. Next slide, please. The BCPS FY 2022 proposed budget for all funds, including general fund, special revenue or grant fund, capital projects fund, debt service and enterprise or food service fund totals $2.31 billion. The special revenue fund covers restricted grants. The two largest are individuals with Disability Education Act and Title I make up 59% of the total budget. The capital projects fund, the capital uh, spending increase of $343 million is due to the counting bonding cycle and the bond issuance approved by voters last November. In the enterprise, the enterprise fund is used to account for all financial activities of the food services program. Next slide, last slide. So uh, on January 12th, we are scheduled to have a board public hearing and work session. Uh, and then on January 19th, we're scheduled to have a board of education work session number two. And then on February 9th, um, we're scheduled to have the board vote to approve the FY 2022 operating budget. So uh, the FY 2022 proposed budget has been posted online and board members will receive hard copies by next week. Please note that because of the ransomware attack and associated lack of system and data access, the proposed budget book is considerably slimmer than before. We expect to have all the data gaps filled in the final adopted budget book, which will be published in July. So with that, I'll turn this back over to Chairwoman Scott. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Williams, for that presentation. And um, now the next item on the agenda is board member. Sorry, um, the next item on the agenda is board member comments. And with that, we will start with Ms. Rell. Ms. Rell. Hi, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I would just like to uh, clarify a couple of things that have been stated. When the board asked for a multi-year plan, the idea behind that multi-year plan was started by advocates for BCPS, Parents and Teachers for Equitable Facilities. And the whole entire concept of a multi-year plan was that there would be an actual plan that would list and outline all of the needs and the dates they would be met, no matter how far out those dates are, and the priority order that would be relatively static in nature. And that is not what we got in the Canon Design Plan. So to say that this plan that the county has come up with is the plan that the board asked for is inaccurate. The board asked for money in a budget to do a plan. The county issued the RFP and is doing what has always been done with every consultant, which is to form advice from the consultant, change capital budgets according to that advice or maybe not completely according to that advice. And then for projects that the communities know they need that are not in the capital request, we still have absolutely no idea when any of those needs are going to get met. And so in my mind, we still do not have an equitable facilities plan that lays out all of the needs and explains when all of those needs are going to be met. 
so that we can communicate to our funding partners what the needs are. And I would still like to see that. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Ms. Causey. Good evening, and I just want to um, associate myself with Ms. Rowe's statements. Um, so while we <clears throat> appreciate that the work is done, there's um, there's more to be done. Um, I'm going to take a different tact. Uh, given the recent urgent and concerning emails and communications from many stakeholders, I felt it was important to provide a response to them. These stakeholders have included parents, students, families, teachers, staff, county council members, county executive, Baltimore County government officials, including law enforcement, all Baltimore County Senate delegation legislators, several Baltimore uh, County delegate legislators, our bargaining units, TABCO, CASE, AFSCME, ESPBC, and OPE, and as the recent chair of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for the past two years and a board member since 2015, I have a unique perspective along with institutional knowledge. And I wanna be clear that these remarks are not as the spokesperson for the board. These are my personal remarks reflecting my individual opinions, experiences, beliefs, concerns, and questions. The purpose for my remarks is to acknowledge the uh, communications and concerns from our stakeholders. It's also an encouragement for continued participation by stakeholders to continue to advocate in their roles for the Board of Education, the superintendent, and the school system to do our best for our students. The school system under the governance, authority, and responsibility of the Board of Education is popularly known as Baltimore County Public Schools. Baltimore County Public Schools is not a separate entity. It is the school system that is governed by the Board of Education. And we have hired a superintendent to provide the administration of that school system. This is also an aspiration for the board's new chair, Makita Scott, and continuing vice chair, Julie Hen, that they receive the appropriate and necessary engagement, communication, cooperation, and support from colleague board members, the superintendent, staff, students, families, elected officials, and communities, so that they can do their important job of facilitating and coordinating the work of the board. I did not realize that we had a two minute uh, deadline yeah. for this, but I do want to say that all of the concerns related to um, communications and governance and oversight and accountability are ones that the board can address and that we've made tremendous progress in the last two years. And um, I will conclude my remarks and at another time I will say a bit more. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Next, we have Ms. Knapp. Thank you. Um, I am hoping that all BCPS staff and BCPS families were able to spend some time decompressing over the holiday break. I'm happy to hear that Governor Hogan um, indicated that teachers are in Group B for the COVID vaccine, since the quicker we all get vaccinated, the quicker we get our students back in school. I was glad to hear just now Dr. Williams' proposed budget prioritizes people because people are who our students are going to need when they return to the classroom. They are going to need counselors. They are going to need, um, they're going to need their teachers to be able to acknowledge them and look them in the eye. They're going to need um, school counselors to help them over the impact of virtual learning and COVID. Um, so I look forward to seeing the budget and seeing that prior prioritization of people because nothing right now will be more important to our students than people. And I'd just like to say that I wish everyone a safe 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Next we have Mr. McMillan. I read fast, I'm gonna to try to slow down. We need to think out of the box. The box has been broken down and recycled. That ship has sailed. We need to plan right now to improve public education so our students can truly compete on a global level. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Ms. Jose. Thank you, Ms. Um, Scott. I want to wish everyone a happy new year and may this year be a year of healing and peace for all, especially our teachers and students. 
I also want to make a quick comment on Ms. Rowe's inaccurate version of the capital budget. This independent report was specifically requested by Ms. Causey at the cost of $1.2 million to the taxpayer dollars. This report is countywide, system-wide, and not just for the central area. We have to be equitable in our actions and decisions and remove politics when we're making our decisions. Thank you and peace out. Thank you, and next we have Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to give thanks to all of our volunteers and education advocates and to take this time to remember one volunteer in particular um, whom I was saddened to learn passed, unfortunately, on Christmas Day this year, and that is Mrs. Marilyn Ryan. Mrs. Ryan served BCPS at Kearney Elementary and other Parkville area schools as well as the PTA Council of Baltimore County for over half a century, along with her husband, John. And in the words of a community member, they just don't make them like Marilyn anymore. Marilyn, you will be remembered fondly as part of the heart of Team BCPS. Thank you for your service. May her memory and her legacy live on and inspire others to continue serving the students and staff of Team BCPS. And I extend my deepest condolences to her husband, John, to her family, to her friends, and all those within BCPS who knew and loved her. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Han. And next we have Mr. Mahomza. Uh, I don't know them much comments. I just want to wish everyone, everyone a happy new year and um, hope we can get this year rolling. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mahomza. Next, we have Mr. Offerman. Uh, so I'd like to thank all the staff for their continuing hard work in these very, uh, these very difficult times and uh, ask the stakeholders to understand that these are complicated issues and uh, we'd love to have simple solutions, but that that uh, that just that just not that just that just does not fit at this time. Thank you and bye. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Next, we have uh, Ms. Pasteur. Uh, back in early November, a Towson High School senior, Joshua Valiza, wrote me an email because he wanted to know how to create a course. He is in Towson's pub, uh, Law and Public Policy Magnet, and part of their responsibility was to write a piece of policy that would help solve a problem. And his second reason for writing the course that he did entitled Mo Modern Politics was because, and he says, I have seen rampant misinformation and misunderstandings spread by both the right and the left, and it pains me to see our society falling, failing in basic understandings of capitalism, institutionalized racism, Obamacare, Trump care, and so much more. And he goes on to herald his magnet program and the other courses he has taken in social studies. Joshua has written a magnificent course that in some way needs to be implemented. I want to thank Ms. Margaret Ann Howey, Dr. McComas, who took the ball from me after Joshua sent the information to me to give him guidance on where to look in terms of state policy, how to fashion a course, and he has done that. Dr. Williams, I'm going to send you Joshua's course outline. Dr. McComas, you will get a copy. Joshua said so. And I bring it up to say thank you to our students who in spite of this are doing wonderful okay. things to stay on point with their education and to thank their teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pastor. And next we have Mr. Poon. Uh, 
Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Ms. Scott. There was a lot of information provided and this has been a long meeting. Um, I think the discussion was worthwhile. Uh, there's a significant amount of information that we shared. Miss um, Pasture, uh, thank you for the shout out to the Towson LPP program. My daughter is literally in the class you just discussed. <laughs> and I probably handed out the various emails. So I'm glad to hear that uh, it's making a difference and that you actually got that information. That's great. It's it's great. Rapid, rapid. So as we roll into 2021, I want people to stay focused, seniors to stay focused. Um, hopefully you all hear good news uh, regarding your college applications before too long. Um, I am going to be focused on trying to move things forward uh, for kids to get back into school. And I'm actually very hopeful that um, uh, the vaccine will be made available to um, educators and staff and that we can get the system up and running again. I know it's been extremely difficult and I thank everyone for all of the, the work that they've done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Next, we have Dr. Hager. Yes, my remarks will be brief. I just want to thank BCPS for their work in getting the COVID dashboard up and running. And I know I'm going to be watching it weekly. It will be published on Fridays. So if you would like to log on, it's really easily accessible on their website. I also look forward to the clear and transparent updates on the reopening plan that we will be hearing at future meetings. I'm glad that that motion passed today at this meeting tonight. So we'll be hearing until every child is back into in a building, we'll be hearing updates from the school system. And I truly believe that these updates will support and improve community trust moving forward. And I just wanna say that I share Ms. Mack's enthusiasm about the vaccination news for our teachers and staff, because I've always believed that our teachers and staff are essential. And I'm thrilled that the state sees you as such as well. And you're being recognized as such. And I'm happy 2020 is behind us and I'm looking forward to 2021 and just wanted to say happy new year. Madam Chair Scott, this is Ms. Causey. Oh, yes, I just needed to uh, call a point of order and clarify, if I may. For board member comments? Yes. Okay. Um, yes, what is your point of order? So we have a policy and board norms in terms of not being disruptive and not uh, uh, providing disparaging remarks. Uh, and I think that needs to be reinforced and I appreciate the comments that you had made earlier to the board regarding civil commentary. I also sure. want to clarify that it is the county and the county executive, as was mentioned, that um, did not provide funding to the Board of Education, but they took on the project themselves, wrote the RFP, okay. selected uh, the vendor, excuse name. me, if I may, Ms. Causey, no, I have to point of order. And I did not have anything to do with the purchase um, or out of order. She's unbelievable. You're out of order? I'm um, not out you're, of order. You're wanting to comment back on a board member comments. Board members I'm, have the right to make their board member comments. And I did comment earlier about us being civil, having civil door discourse, and respecting each person and each person's role on this board. And so, board members are entitled and allowed to make board member comments, which is what we are going around and what we are doing now. And it's actually my turn now to make my comments. So Madam Chair, Madam Chair I'm calling a point of order and if we can ask Mr. Brusades to clarify, but you gave me the floor to acknowledge my point of order and it is a point of order that is allowed to provide clarifying information. So there was information that was stated with my name personally attached, that was inaccurate, and I was clarifying that. Thank you. Your board member comments? Okay, well, I would like to say that again, it's my turn to make board member um, for my comments. And as I have said before, we need to be able to have civil discourse. We need to be able to respect each other as members of this board and respect everyone's opinion and everyone's position on various opinions. We have had a robust conversation. We have heard differing views. We are each here to represent the children. We're here to represent staff. We're here to represent parents, but we're also here to work together and to lead by an example. And 
being able to communicate effectively with one another and respect each other and respect the rules is something that is should be the core of everything that we do. So going into 2021, one of the things I would like to see for us as a board to do to lead by example by working well together, speaking kindly to each other and acknowledging that we may have differing views, but respecting each other for their views and being able to communicate our views in an effective and professional manner because we set the tone, we set the example for staff, for everyone else, and especially for the children who are watching. So we need to lead by example. And with that note, I would like to wish everyone a happy new year. I thank you staff for staying with us until 11 <laughs> at night. Um, for all of the parents and everyone who may be listening, I thank you for staying with us and for supporting us. And also I thank every member of this board. We may have differing opinions, but I respect each of you and I enjoy working with each of you. And I'm very proud of the work that we have done and that we are doing and the work that we will continue to do. So thank you for your service. Thank you for your volunteerism. So um, with that, the next item on the agenda is the consideration of agenda items for future board meetings. And with that, I will start with Ms. Rowe. Ms. Rowe? Okay, so we will go around. Um, again, this is consideration uh, for uh, items. Yeah, to of... unmute. Oh, sorry, Ms. Rowe. No. Thank you. Yeah. It takes a minute for star six to catch up. Okay. Um, I, I do not believe that I have any future agenda items at this time, besides the one that was stated at the last meeting, which is to have um, a, an update in the general meeting for the APFO task force. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair Scott. Um, I would ask that we have a agenda item to reflect updating the uh, community on the ransom attack recovery. Um, and I also agree with um, Ms. Rowe in having the APFO um, because that's important. And in previous meetings, Ms. Mack has asked about analysis of the projections and the development of the student counts um, report. Uh, so I think that that's timely to uh, have on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Next, we have Ms. Mack. I have nothing at this time, Madam Chair. Thank you. Have a good evening. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Mack. Uh, next, we have Mr. McMillian. No, thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, next we have Ms. Jose. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Scott, you're doing a great job. I'm gonna follow Mr. McMillian, no thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Jose. Next we have Ms. Hen. Nothing at this time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Next we have Mr. Mahumza. No, thanks, Madam Chair, I appreciate you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mahumza. Uh, next we have Mr. Offerman. Nothing, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Next, we have Ms. Pastor. Again, I ask for a report on adequate facilities. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pastor. Next, we have Mr. Kuhn. Okay, I've got three quick items. First, I would like to know about planning for the SAT tests for juniors. I know we usually do this in the spring and focus their energies to provide them with that opportunity. Uh, the next item that I'm continuously interested is is AP tests. Uh, what's available uh, across the entire organization, our, our entire enterprise of Baltimore County, and um, what are the results that we're getting? Um, and then the last question, I think uh, we just touched on it today, but we really need to focus on, and this will be part of the update, but answer questions around vaccine uh, availability for staff and its impact on our opening plan going forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Mr. Kuhn. Next, we have Dr. Hager. 
Yes, I have two quick um, things to add. Uh, the first we talked about earlier in the meeting, and that was the kind of step-by-step -step reopening plan, exactly what would happen once we meet those metrics. I think Dr. Williams called it the Ready, Set, Go plan, which I, <laughs> I like the name of that. Um, and then the second topic is that uh, last meeting, Dr. Williams mentioned the focus on academic learning centers during the fall semester. I would love an update on how that went or how it's going and lessons learned, and perhaps that could be in um, an equity committee, committee meeting even or during regular open session. That's it. Okay, thank you for that, Dr. Hager. And um, last is me, and I do not have any um, items um, for the for future board meetings. So um, thank you all for that. The last item on the agenda is announcements. The board's um, public hearing and work session on the FY 2022 operating budget that was presented this evening will be held virtually on Tuesday, January 12th, 2021, beginning at 6.30 p.m. The board's next meeting will be held virtually on Tuesday, January 19th, 2021, at 6.30 p.m. as well. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. The meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.